He gave me that look that uh, he's given many a people in his in his time. And um, as he sped off into the distance, I was sitting in this car, looked at myself in the mirror and thought, I need to get rid of this. Off the ball. Weeknights from seven and weekends from one. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB Sports Radio. A very good morning to you. It turns out it's not our world, it's not the IRFU's world, it's Simon Harris's world and he gets to call all the shots and the rest of us are just living in it. He's apparently going to meet the IRFU or at least talk to them today at 11 o'clock to explain why he thinks that uh, the game should be called off. Didn't tell them first. Didn't, they found out around the same time as the rest of everybody. Leaves them looking a little bit out of the loop. It's, it's amazing to me how that government and that IRFU couldn't put together a bid to win the World Cup. Seems like, you know, those guys, they're, they're, all, they're very well connected, right? Mm. Ah, in fairness, they had not the best selection of stadiums to work with. We, we, we will give them that. But uh, on, the, on this particular occasion, it's obviously something that Simon Harris was like, yep, yeah, we shall cancel this game. It will be advisable for us to cancel this game. And then the RFU are like, we actually didn't have this conversation. So this morning, we'll know there will be... Because we were on the RFU yesterday before kick-off of this show, and they're like, the game's gone ahead. What are you talking about? And, um, and then Simon Harris sent people out afterwards to go, oh, I, I made the decision. Oh, it was my recommendation that we had to uh, get rid of this because uh, on public health grounds, what else could you do? I mean, well, you could let the game go ahead. Like, could let the game go ahead. But, you know, we've, we've had a bunch of skiers, apparently. A lot of, as somebody pointed out on Twitter, a lot of um, schools go skiing. Turns out they do, yeah. I was like... <laughs> uh, somebody made the point, on the, I'm stealing somebody, I don't know whose joke it was on Twitter, it was like, oh, we were lucky if we got to go to the uh, Cadbury factory. Um, I mean, the Cadbury factory sounds like... Uh, An exotic. Exactly. And our school tours were... Tremor, that Bunratty Castle. That's pretty good, educational. Uh, I mean, there's nothing to do there. You got out of your county, at least. <laughs> we did. Well, in fairness, Kerry's pretty nice, though, right? Well, we got to go to Poland on one occasion, so... All oh, right. I, I'm ju I just got the, the beginning of this, obviously, upsurge in school tours. Right, cheap flights. Uh, cheap flights, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the skiers, obviously, in, in graver danger than anybody who would have gone on a historical school tour to uh, Poland, I guess. Um, but, uh, like, we're, we're not the health experts here. We can't dictate what policy should be as a result of coronavirus. You make the point that maybe the game could just go ahead normally. Uh, I think the greatest danger of the game going ahead is that there will be uber paranoia of people going into work the next day with the sniffles. We went to the game. And then they'd be like, oh, we went to the game. And in actual fact, you just sat outside in temperatures that perhaps would be sub-zero. And maybe you actually weren't sitting beside somebody who's brought this disease from Italy sitting beside you. That would be the biggest. That would be a, a large danger. I would have thought, but there was clearly a realistic health uh, risk here. If this is what the Department of Health are saying, and I would bow to their superior knowledge personally, oh. maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, they could. I mean, they could obviously have told the RFU first, though, right? But or without question, it's. Uh, I don't think that's. Or unless it was just really low down the priority list. Maybe, like, if you're somebody I've who's... I've got to go public with this so urgently that I can't tell the people who are going to be most impacted. Is, is every minister at the moment not just on their kind of schools out sort of well, it's, situation? It's amazing they're actually doing a bit of work, I'm surprised. I mean, do, is there some way that they're, like, getting paid extra for showing up? Is there, like, a bonus? There must be. There must be, like, this must count towards your pension, otherwise they'll all be back in their constituency doing nothing. Exactly. I mean, in fairness, you, you get to keep the ministerial merc... Obviously, they pay your mobile phone bill. There's, you know, there's the, the perks of being a minister apply until you're no longer a minister. So, I mean, you can't, can't be swanning around in the ministerial market unless you're actually doing a bit of work as well, right? Yeah, maybe not. Like, he, I suppose, just one last trip in the ministerial work down to Donnybrook to appear on 6-1 and casually say, yeah, of course, uh, we, can, we can cancel the game. 
you're there. But no, I think it, once this media comes out the, this morning, it looks like it's going to be called off. Oh, and I think you like, can't I'd, now I'd be, go I'd be ahead. astonished if it wasn't called off at this well, point. They'll, they'll what about behind closed doors? Wouldn't that be? Wouldn't that be totally? I mean, the Italians have to come from Italy. Is that? Is it anybody coming from Italy? Is the issue? As long as they weren't in that ski resort, or whatever. Like I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they are just as much of a risk as the whatever fifteen hundred Italian supporters that will also come with them, or maybe it's just a, 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 an amount of people over a certain number. To be honest with you, I don't know, and uh, I, I would, I would actually be very surprised if it was. Okay, well, let's talk about the sporting impact of it then. All of a sudden, Andy Farrell's going from having a an easy tomato can game, a home match to, ooh, let's assume the France game goes ahead because, I mean, let's face it, if the Italy game is cancelled, the France game is more than likely going to be cancelled too. But for now, the France game stands. Um, what does it mean for Andy Farrell? It's like, oh, man. So I'm going to drop all those players who didn't play well and put a bunch of debutants essentially, or first full cap, first competitive start, first six nations away in Paris mm. against a French team rampaging through, slaloming towards the Grand Slam? Well, it's going to have to be, isn't it? It doesn't really have any option now. He's going to have to make changes. and Because I think, like I think Darcy has a line this morning, that the most extraordinary course of action now, from Andy Farrell's point of view, would be to do no nothing changes. at all. Yeah. And that's not going to happen. There will be changes. He calls for a replacement of the entire back row. Yeah. Now, for the France game. For the France, like, but it's going to have to be for... I think this is more about us rather than the opposition at this point. I don't think... I don't think Ireland are going to win the championship now. And like I know they're still within a shot if they say if the Italy game does get postponed and you end up going to Paris and winning, then all of a sudden it's like uh, beat, uh, beat Italy by a certain number of points and you win the championship on uh, in, in September or whatever. Yeah. So that, that would actually be an interesting dynamic to it. But like he, he one hundred percent is going we're going to see a very, very different Ireland team the next day, whether or not that's against Italy or France, whatever that the next day is. It is going to be changed, and I actually don't think it'll factor into his thinking. More than likely, none of these games goes ahead, and what what does that mean for? How do we feel about the last thing that we've had happen to us in Irish rugby as an international team is we've been pummeled, mm -hmm. humiliated, had our pants pulled down. Yeah, well, I guess it would be the year that we would reflect on as the coronavirus year, rather than the year where Ireland got the, the rare standards in buying. All right, so it's a get out of jail free card. One hundred percent. Well, ah, it, it, yes. It, it, not not a get out of jail free card. Uh, a legacy uh, top up is what I would say. I like, like this. You, you were talking about the foot and mouth thing earlier on uh, in the office. That we blew a grand slam. Yeah, nobody ever talks about that, but everybody remembers the foot and mouth cancelling games. I think those of us who were around at the time, Owen. Those of us around us, I remember that we blew a grand slam because we didn't have a warm-up game. So we were we were going fine and dandy, won a couple of games. Uh, foot and mouth happens. Rest of the season is shelved. Comes back in September. Didn't have a warm-up game. Lost the first game, I think, against Scotland, and then won the last two. It was like, what? If only we just had a warm-up game and got into the. It was. I'm pretty sure. I haven't looked back at the figures or the dates or the matches, but I'm pretty sure it was the Scots who beat us, um, and they were a rubbish Scots team. Had we beaten them, would we have had the bottle at that point in Irish rugby yeah. to actually win a Grand Slam? Yeah, we had a decent team. Very good team, as well as the, one of the first good teams, the, our, our first good team in professional rugby. This is the sliding doors where it would have been Gatland who won a Grand Slam, and so then Gatland would never, he would have been unsackable. Mm. Remember, that was our, our first Grand Slam since the 40s. Mm. Like, 2011 never would have happened. We would have probably overturned well. He would have had like a 15 year uh, maybe, coaching career with Ireland. Yeah, he reached the World Cup semi final, a final. Wins one. Yeah. Who knows? Actually, yeah, no, you're dead right. Not uh, scheduling that warm up game definitely means we would if we had done that, we would have won the World Cup. No question about it. Maybe he yeah. becomes a great coach with us as opposed to at Wasps and at, um, at Wales. There might have been less pain inflicted upon Ireland by Warren Gatland rather than uh, the other way around uh, had uh, that been different, maybe. But I, I still think that it is foot and mouth year. That's the main thing that's what, uh, that people remember. Uh, but I, I'm glad that somebody actually remembers the rugby that was played that year. 2001 it was, um, obviously, and I'm just trying to look at the, uh, the results here. So um, we beat France in the second round. We beat Italy in the first round away, we hammered them 41-22, beat them at home 22-15, and um, that was it. And then we come back. Uh, the rest of the tournament played out without us. Scotland hammer us 32-10 in the first match in September back. And then we go to Wales and beat them in Wales, 36-6. And then we beat England at home, 2014. God, that was quite a pummeling we gave Wales, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, like, that, that would have been an interesting slam decider against England in the year 2001. Scotland squeaked a win against Italy 
in March at home, by example, annihilated by England, 43-3, drew with Wales at home, 28 all, and uh, beaten by France, 16-6. So they were crap. And that was all down to the fact that there was no warm-up game. It, the, was that actually a theme at the time? That it was like, well, what are we doing going into? Well, I mean, uh, I don't know what the science says, um, but like, does it not make sense to have a... So we've won two games. We're playing, we're playing a bunch of matches here now. We're unbeaten. We're the only ones who could actually go and do a grand slam here. We've got an England team who are a bit out of sorts in our final game. We've got a Welsh team who aren't very good, and this Scotland team are pants. What's mm -hmm. going to happen with them? So, I don't know. We might do a piece on that. Uh, with Keith Wood and talk to him about um, what happened. I'm looking for the report here. 32-10. Can you believe it? Gervin Dempsey scored a consolation try in injury time to get us to 10. So obviously it was 32-3 with like minutes left. It's when the, the Scots had the grip over us. I mean, I'm not even sure they did. And we had a good team. Horgan, Hickey, O'Gara, O'Driscoll, Dempsey, Classy, Wood, Hayes, Jeremy Davidson, Malcolm O'Kelly. Like David's in the line at that stage. Simon needs to be Dawson and Foley. Um, Emmett Byrne on the bench. David Wallace on the bench. Stringer on the bench. Humphreys and Mags. That's a great team. It does make you wistful for the times when a uh, deadly outbreak of disease came at a time when Ireland were on course for Grand Slams. Um, I <clears> so <throat> if it had happened just a week previous, we'd have. Yeah, you know, it would have been nostalgic rather than uh, kind of a, a, a comma in this sentence that is a, a bad 2020 that's unfolding. You can cancel the game, but you cancel all the flights from Italy was a question that. Um, that's a very legitimate question, I would have thought. So the Italians who booked to come to the match, the game is cancelled. But like, come on over anyway and have the crack and... But just please quarantine yourself in Temple Bar. Smear your juice around Temple Bar. Like, swap as many bodily fluids as you possibly can with... I mean, luckily enough, it'll all be tourists. So, uh, it will be grand. <laughs> is that it? It's like the, the jumping off spot for the disease to go truly worldwide. When, when, when they like make the sort of... The other... Sorry, go on. When they make this sort of uh, hip scientific film in the years to come about the coronavirus and the scientists are in their lab coats looking at the Petri dish, kind of like it zooms back and it comes back to Temple Bar. Yeah. Whereas the where explosion it all goes. Yeah. The, um, the other aspect of this is that there'll be nothing for us to talk about on sports shows except for when these potential fixtures <laughs> might start again. It's like no football, no rugby, no racing. Like, so none of this has actually been cancelled just yet, but they're. they're our messages coming out, don't worry, Cheltenham's fine. Don't worry, all these Champions League games are fine. But like once they start cancelling the big fixtures, then everything is going to have to go because rightly or wrongly, one sports organisation is going to look at another one and go, hang on a second, why is that one being policed differently from us? Mm -hmm. So at what point does Serie A shut down, which becomes La Liga, which becomes the Champions League? Yeah, if, like that I would say is a fairly contagious thing that you will see different hey. footballings cancelling. Well, yeah. Here we go. Uh, I would say I would. I, I thought Cheltenham would have been a different scenario. Like I know that that, that is under severe threat, but like obviously when Cheltenham went in 2001, that was a no-brainer given how deadly foot and mouth was within livestock in Ireland. But this is a largely an Irish-British event, Cheltenham. Like it, has it got to the stage where public gatherings like uh, within these two countries need to be questioned? If so, this weekend's Premier League game should be under threat. Yeah, immediately. That's, what, that's what's going to happen. This weekend's GA game should be under threat if Cheltenham is under did threat. Did the Premier League continue in 2001 or did it stop? I don't recall Premier League games being uh, being stopped. I think the I think the whole, but the whole thing about foot and mouth was like a very Irish thing, wasn't it? It was because like all Irish horse, horses would be going over to Cheltenham and obviously uh, the Irish rugby team as well, uh, rather than it being kind of a, a fully British thing. Um, foot and mouth was apparently a threat to the Lions tour back then, but obviously it wasn't. Um, I'm just trying to find that. I can't see it. I can't see any, anywhere saying that foot and mouth was um, a, a cause for cancellation. But let's start with that anyway from the sports news overnight. 7.44 this morning here on OTBAM. The IRFU appeared to have been caught off guard last night by a Department of Health directive to cancel the Six Nations meeting with Italy. They're seeking an urgent meeting with the Health Minister, Simon Harris, with that meeting set to be held this morning at 11am. Fears over the spread of the coronavirus led to the Department's decision although obviously they haven't got the ability to cancel the game, but they do expect the IRFU to follow their uh, advice. The IRFU want the specific reasoning behind the call to cancel the March 7th game at the Aviva Stadium. Minister Harris said the directive could also see, sorry, would also see the women's and under-20 games with Italy called off as well. A nightmare second half likely cost Chelsea a place in the quarterfinals of the Champions League. Lewandowski scored one and Serge Gnabry for, uh, scored a brace. 
set up by Lewandowski in a 3-0 win for Bayern Munich away to Chelsea. The task for Frank Lampard's side was made no easier by the late sending off of Marcus Alonso. Elsewhere last night, Barcelona fell behind away to Napoli before salvaging a one-all draw. Manchester City manager Pep Guardiola says Raheem Sterling has fully recovered from a hamstring injury and is fit to play in tonight's last 16 first leg with Real Madrid. Tonight's game in Spain is City's first European outing since they were handed a ban from UEFA competitions over financial fair play breaches. Obviously, it's great that they're playing in Real Madrid, where notoriously they haven't given a shit about financial fair play, stretching back decades. A point where they were about to go bust in the late 90s, early noughties, when luckily the, the Spanish government decided to do a property deal with them which pretty much wiped out all their debts. It was an amazing piece of serendipity mm. that Real Madrid had the, uh, the property, and the property was so valuable that they were able to write down their debts in one fell swoop. Um, so, you know, uh, cast your stones at Manchester City, but save some for the rest of European football too. Tonight's other game sees Lyon play host to Juventus. Both matches are underway at 8 o'clock. Rangers take a 3-2 lead into this evening's Europa League Last 32, second leg away to Braga. There's a 5 p.m. start to that game in Portugal. It's semi-finals night later in the Airgrid Munster Under-20 Football Championship. Limerick's meeting with Kerry has been moved to McNeville Park in Rathkeel after the LIT Gaelic Rounds failed a pitch inspection. Tonight's other game sees Clare face Cork in Milltown Malbay and both games throw in at 7 o'clock. You got some There's a bit news? of breaking news overnight. Uh, posted on Twitter, uh, eagle-eyed Tommy Rooney spotted this in the office this morning. Uh, it was sorry, Arthur in the office uh, spotted us. This is Tullerone captain uh, Shane Walsh. She can't seem to find the lads anywhere in the snow. They're hard, there's a lot of nice coming out of this caravan. Hey, hey, what's, go what's going on in here? Taggy's inspired us. Give up the hurl and start the dancing. <laughs> Text in 5-3-1-2-5. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the lads are having the crack. All Ireland Club champions. <laughs> I, w I would 100% watch uh, any Father Ted episode recreated by the Walsh family. Just uh, step in there. Could they go on as a troop in, in next year's competition? Would that be possible? I would say 100%. I would, I would say give them their own show. Look, keep, that's Keeping up it. with the Walshes. That, that's exactly it. There's like a, there's a billion dollar enterprise right there if they just uh, set some reality cameras on them. I'd like E! Entertainment, would, uh, their numbers would go through the roof if they had Keeping up with the Walshes on their network over in the United States. Th this, is, this is the sort of thing that the world needs. Oh, and, and this is, these, are the, these are the ideas you're not supposed to give away for nothing on the show. You're supposed to like take them away, get some seed capital turn it into a pilot and become rich. This is how, this is how you get rich. I'm a man of the people. I'm, I just stand on my soapbox and uh, give everybody... If you listen closely, you will actually make a lot of money off everything I say. Here's uh, what's coming up on the show for you. A busy show for you, despite the fact that there's no rugby to talk about now in 10 days' time. But, um, and also, I'm just a little bit concerned that this is going to become a theme for the next I, few I days. I forgot about... Look, what, what, how come the swine flu never claimed any fixtures back in the day? Because I ran onto the pitch with uh, swine flu when Kerry won the All-Ireland in 2009. I just, it, just, uh, it just dawned on me when we were talking about sporting events and uh, diseases that caught national headlines. You had swine flu? I turned out I had. I'd come to, I had got serious temperature driving up to Dublin and uh, I was diagnosed a couple of days later. Do you later. still have it? Is like oh, a, yeah. Per is it a residual thing? Permanently it's... contagious, yeah. Go on. Uh, no, just, like, and there, there, was no, there was no stopping of fixtures around that time, even though it was like a fairly... Uh, even though it had spread properly around this country. So it's September 2009? Yeah. And you, little little Owen, at home with his folks, going to the game? Uh, with my, with a mate of mine, yeah. I went up with a, a bus of supporters. So a bus? Yeah. F so started. you're on the bus and you're like sitting there going, ah. Well, no, not that, that bad. started to feel a little bit ill. On the way home I was, but like I can remember running onto the pitch when pitch invasions were loud and I was like, my legs feel so weak, what is going on? There? Like to my friend, hold on, <laughs> as they were running away and I was like, no, I can't keep up. I can't keep up. This feels great that Kerry won the All Ireland, but terrible because I don't know what's wrong. I was like, ah, it's, it's fine. And then the next day, the GP was like, yep. Swine flu? Yeah. Straight away, right? No, didn't even need to send it off. And uh, did you get on table bar kissing some young one? <laughs> uh, I had to, to lie, on my, uh, lie on my bed for days and miss all the celebrations and things like that, but it's okay. We got another one in 2014. Right, 7.50 this morning. Here's what's coming up on the show this morning. Uh, Graham Hunter's coming your way at 8 o'clock. We're going to preview the Manchester City game at Real Madrid tonight. Uh, top five stories of the day that we're covering for you at 8.15. Shot clock with Kieran Donahue at 8.30 this morning. After that, we've got uh, sports news. Um, 
Uh, Keoghan and Garrity, it is a uh, mead bonanza, a mead sandwich coming your way at nine o'clock. And uh, we're talking about um, a bunch of Irish people raising money for a gym in Palestine that's coming your way at uh, 10 minutes past nine this morning. Time now for the newspapers. OCB AM. Power surge, early uh, tab in the morning for you from the examiner, Gnabry Double, Gnabry Double. Helps Bayern batter Blues, so Serge Gnabry obviously uh, a bit of a superstar in European football at the moment. Um, Donald Lenehan, why I'm so excited by the new generation of Irish player coming through the system. Uh, pep talk, Guardiola insists it isn't now or never for City, but it is. It is now or never for City. Like, there, this could well be the very last opportunity they get to play in the Champions League with him as their manager. Because even if he says he's sticking around, is he going to stick around for three seasons? They're banned for two years after this? So he sticks around for this year season through the next two years and is he definitely going to be the manager in three years time this that's a long long time away i really see this whole thing as part of the pr push by manchester city that they're going to get off the hook i think pep saying that he's going to stay is all part of the false universe they've created inside their own heads that this thing is going to be okay like it seems that a lot of people are saying that you know if they get banned for two years like they have been banned for two years. That is what is happening. It would take an overturn of this decision. Like this is not. We're not waiting on confirmation here. It has been confirmed that Manchester City are banned for two years. Now they'll do their best to, to turn that around. But as it stands, like Pep Guardiola is not a, ma a Champions League manager next season or the season after that. And I just can't see him hanging around. So yes, it is the last chance saloon uh, for this current manager and this group of, group of players to win a Champions League for Manchester City. In my view, uh, the Irish Independent this morning. Is major doubts over sporting fixtures. Minister to meet IRFU as spread of the coronavirus puts events under threat. And war of words erupts in Michelot GEA after match abandoned amid race row. This is Dunica Boyle with a story about a Division 1 match in Michelot between Rathnew and Tinahili. It was abandoned amid allegations that a Rathnew player was racially abused. Besides, they met on Sunday, uh, the opening round of the league action. The game was abandoned after just 16 minutes by the referee Pat Dunn. The official is understood to have shown two red cards and a handful of yellows before coming together between players from both sides, saw him abandon the fixture. He was the only official at the venue uh, and uh, was not contact, or could not be contacted, I should say, for comment yesterday. Uh, a tweet from Rathnew Club's Twitter account claimed, Ref Pat Dunn calls a halt to the match after what he says to our chairman, racial abuse to one of our players. So Tinahili denied any links to the accusations in the strongest possible terms, it should be said in this. So uh, interesting to see if anything more comes from that story. Uh, okay, Corona Chaos is the back page headline on the Irish Daily Mail. And uh, it's Italy game off, Cheltenham and Olympics at risk. That's the other one, sorry, the Olympics. We didn't even talk about the Olympics. Um, Dick Pound was saying that they have until May to get the situation under control and that'll be the cutoff point for the Olympics. If the virus isn't contained by the end of May, the, um, the games are under threat. So that is, I'm, I'm, like... I, again, I, I don't know, but it, it doesn't seem to be abating in this part of the world. Uh, like, obviously, the origins are in Asia. Like, Japan is a high-risk territory at the moment for the coronavirus. But, uh, as I say, over here, it doesn't seem to uh, show any signs of slowing down. So it's going to be a, a big two months, um, given, given the location of the Olympics. James Ryan also yesterday he was uh, doing a bit of press and he was asked about whether or not he would be interested in captaining Ireland and uh, I'm not sure if I was even in the conversation from a management point of view so I don't want to blow my trumpet here but if the captaincy of your country is there on your plate and they're saying do you want to be captain you would say of course so um, rugby player says yes to uh, promotion um, well he wasn't the he is in the leadership group isn't he so I presume he would have thought that it was on the plate or at least he's in one of the contenders. Yeah, I mean, look, it makes sense to have your second row who is a hit at his age as part of the leadership group. It probably has a bit to go before, like, it's a bit young. He's not... Why, why not let him captain Ireland in the Australia tour? Well... If, like, and I'm not talking about for the whole tour, I'm talking about games that Sexton isn't going to be starting because Carberry will be back for the summer tour. What happens if Caelan Doris turns out is actually a better captain? Like, what's the rush to crown the next captain? We have... Sexton, who's going to be there for the next couple of years, right? Who, more than likely, who at the moment is our unimpeachable number one out half, even when he's playing badly. Nobody is close to Sexton in terms of their ability at the moment to push him out of that team. So Sexton's going to be, when fit, nailed on. Carberry will get there when he's back fit. But when, when is Joey Carberry going to be fit? He's just had more surgery on the ankle injury mm. that we rushed him back from last August. 
to play in the World Cup. It is now the end of February. He is unlikely to play again this season. Maybe he goes on the Australian tour, but maybe that's not the right thing for him either. So, Carby will push him close. We don't, like, we haven't seen... I really hope Joey Carby pushes him close. We haven't seen it. So, like, let's just cool the Jets on anointing stuff for the future. And But it would be a temporary thing is what I'm saying. Like, it'll give the taste of it in Australia. Uh, maybe, but is, is Sexton not going to go to Australia? Like, when, when we are at this point where for the next six months everything counts towards world rankings, which counts for a, a World Cup draw. Sexton will draws, go to Australia, yeah. yeah so let him play. For, for, for like, he, he might not play all the tests. If there is a test that Ross Byrne, or if, maybe if they do rush Carberry back, does start, then you look around, once Sexton is out of the team, who is your captain, I think that giving James Ryan that taste for one or two tests would be an excellent opportunity for him. Maybe it's not him though, maybe it goes, maybe the captaincy goes to Robbie Henshaw after Sexton. Yeah, and I, and like, that might be a more appropriate, immediate, short-term thing. Like, I, I don't know, it's just that this whole kind of, let's make him the captain now, because it worked really well with Brian O'Driscoll. Like, maybe James Ryan needs to, his game is still evolving. If you looked at the aggression that he was showing in the tackle uh, against England, that was, I, I thought, great to see, and it was different from him. So we need to see a bit more of that. Like, let his game evolve and develop. If, he, if he, you make him captain and his job is to be cool and temperate with the referee and then you want him to go over and smash people, maybe that's not the right thing for him right now. Let's see him smash people for a year or two and then be able to do the coolness. Like, he was getting involved in scuffles. Is that what you want your captain to be doing? But I want James Ryan to be doing it. Mm. No? Uh, can you not do both? No. I suppose you're too busy talking to the ref instead of getting involved in scuffles. And if you're getting involved in scuffles, the referee's coming over going, I'm sorry, am I supposed to be respecting you? You're getting involved in scuffles. Who's going to tell you to calm down? Mm. Like, let him get involved in scuffles. We need a bit of that. Uh, the sun this morning is smashing nab. Two lamps blow in latest London power surge. Uh, you've got Harris in RFU Summit and Brady Hunch, it'll blow over. So this is David Brady admitting Tim O'Leary made a mistake with his boozy post on social media uh, at the weekend, but insisted that Mayo football is not about one man. I think he was talking on off the ball last night. Uh, so the Guardian, turn back page with power surge as well. Ruthless Nabry leads the way. His brilliant Byron floor Chelsea, uh, making up the numbers. England's flexibility points way to a huge future. So um, English rugby's feeling pretty. It's feeling itself. Just generally, it's like if it was chocolate, it would eat itself at the moment, you know. And uh, fish rots in the head. I think is the phrase I'm looking for. The Daily Telegraph this morning is Chelsea pray for a miracle. Lampard's men face Champions League exit after brilliant Bayern brushed them aside. Sick nations then is their headline on the rugby Ireland versus Italy set to be called off over coronavirus fears. And Murray Misery, Scott could miss Wimbledon as he faces more surgery. Just to, to talk a bit, a bit about this, it's Robert Kitson's piece in The Guardian. Uh, Jones takes us closer to a one-size-fits-all future. Coaches have long spoken of upskilling players so shirt numbers don't matter. It's happening in the Six Nations. He's talking about um, last season, he was talking about Jack Nowell playing at flanker. Now he reckons Saracen's back row, Ben Earl, could do a job in the backs. His bench for Sunday ostensibly comprised six forwards and two backs. His matchday squad of 23 had five specialist second rows, but he's making the point that um, anybody can play anywhere. George Cruz, a lock, aiming to kick the ball out of hand. How did that work out? It's a shit kick. How did that work out? It's like, oh, look at this thing that happened. It's amazing. The second row, shanked a kick. Anyway. Uh, Charlie Yules and Mullerlock could be seen packing down at number eight. Yules Bath teammate Jonathan Joseph was on the wing, having played all his top level rugby at centre. England have invented and reinvented the game of rugby in the space of six weeks here. Well done, England. Congratulations. Back page of the Irish Daily Star is Bayham, Bayham, uh, Chelsea torn apart by Munich. Bayham. Yeah, but like I mean, it's obviously with uh, the Bayern Munich start, but, you know. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not giving the uh, like. Uh, Mayo count cost of cutting O'Leary ties is the headline there. Obviously, the decision uh, to cut ties with him would cost him an initial 250 grand. United to Europe cost full shocking cost. Manchester United's Champions League exile was revealed yesterday. Uh, Vice Chairman Ed Woodward vowed United would continue a squad rebuild. And Mick's goal plan. Mick McCarthy has ordered his boys in green to bring their scoring boots to Bratislava for next month's Euro 2020 playoff. <laughs> <laughs> WhatsApp, WhatsApp uh, message, I presume. Lads, don't forget your scoring boots. Uh, thumbs up, thumbs up. Irish flag. Let's do this. Hashtag Coy Big or something like that in the WhatsApp group. Um, so, yeah, Shane Long, Scott Hogan, Enda Stevens, Callum Robinson, and Alan Brown were among the goal scorers last weekend. So. 
that turns out they're polishing the scoring boots at the moment. So now you need to put them in the bag and get them through customs. Front page of the mirror is a uh, fever pitch. Six Nations clash set to fall victim to coronavirus crisis. Students in Tenerife tourists in infection fears in the back page of the Daily Mirror. Is this a headline of the day? Surge and destroy? Yeah, that's top of the, top of the morning to you. Is it? Seek and destroy? Just, I, I've, um, on the back of last night's success for Surge and Abbey, I've compiled my uh, top three Ireland versus Germany moments in the history of football. So at number three, you have Shane Long's goal against Germany. Number two, you have Robbie Keane's goal against Germany. At number one, you've James McLean beating Serge Gnabry to the left wing spot in Tony Pulis's West Brom site. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, could could he could he could he have found room for both of those superstars in his team? It's the, the common dilemma that most managers face, isn't it? Yeah, it's like Frank Lampard and Steven Gerrard not being able to play together. And then just the final one for me is that there's a picture there of um, the Man City lads all dressed up in their denim. They, so there was these weird photographs emerging yesterday. Uh, people saying. Uh, Sterling fit and ready to go is the headline of that piece, but I don't know if we have any of those photographs. Uh, it was like, ah, oh, money can't buy taste, but it seemed to be standard issue. They were all wearing the same bad jeans and bad denim tops, which I couldn't work out if they were denim shirts or denim jackets or kind of a shacket. Uh, more, I think more of a shacket, to be honest. A jerk. A jerk. Um, <laughs> It's sickening, really. The, the, uh, uh, anything denim above the waist uh, should be banned, as far as I'm concerned. Do you, well, no, there's room for a good denim jacket and everybody's wardrobe that you take out once every couple of years and go, mm. um, but certainly not with uh, the same colour, the, what is it, Texas Tuxedo, is that what it's called? Uh, something like that, yeah. Um, so, they have to wear them? Or they're choosing to wear them because they're free? Which is it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it wasn't, uh, didn't all the dubs go on a night out last year like wearing the exact same clothes jacket, uh, supplied by Jack and Jones or the year before? Like I can get that when you're amateur sports people, it's like, yeah, take it for a year sort of thing. Yeah. When you're, when you're earning half a million quid a week. A week. Uh, you can probably say, actually, uh, Mr. Endorsement person, I actually don't want to wear that particular set of clothes. I've got uh, a pair of trackies and a t-shirt that I actually find more comfortable. And when you're all in a group together, I mean, they look a bit like they were in a chain gang. Mm. Like, oh, they've right. all, they're all they guilty like, of... They're uh, like a male stripper gang, to be quite honest with you. I thought that's what they kind of looked like uh, rolling through yesterday. But, uh, like, I mean, it must, be, it must be uniformed. It must be instructed to actually wear this sort of thing. I don't know. Uh, back page of The Times is Ireland coronavirus threat. Minister says Italy match should not go ahead. Fears grow over England's Six Nations Rome trip as well. Uh, Trump open dream shelved. President Trump will have to put his dream of hosting an Open Championship at Turnbury on hold after the merge of the Ayrshire course has effectively been knocked off the tournament rota for the foreseeable future. So uh, he obviously bought Turnbury in 2014, two years before uh, he became president. Wah, 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 wah. It's hosted the Open four times since it was added to the rota in 1977. So it's going to have to wait a little while longer. And Murray doubts Wimbledon, as already mentioned. Yeah, the Herald have an interesting uh, angle there saying that the IRFU are, won't yet rule out the Italy match. They're like, no, screw you, Simon Harris. We get to decide. Maybe if you'd called us up first, we would all have the same decision to make. But in the meantime, we haven't officially called this fixture off. Which, you know, I think is probably fair enough. And then also they have the race row in Wicklow GA. That's the uh, Tina Healy Rath New and the accusations that um, there was some racial abuse, which obviously the referee reported and decided to abandon the game after he heard something. So, uh, The Irish Times goes with Gnabry at the double for Bayern as Chelsea are blown away. Precious Griezmann goal earns Barcelona draw and United's net debt rises by 85.7 million euro to 455.5 million euro. And uh, that's the Irish Times this morning. And uh, offtheball.com for you. So here's what we've got up on offtheball.com. The under 10 town league final was the greatest sporting event <laughs> ever, which is the most David Brady quote of all time, but you can see exactly... Uh, what he's talking about. Great interview with um, David last night. I look back on his career, some uh, current Mayo stuff as well. That's all available for you on offtheball.com. And um, I personally get worried, Niall Quinn, on the heading ban, which is echoing sentiments that we'd heard on the show from Gary Breen the previous night as well. Obviously, Gary, uh, Gary Breen and Niall Quinn, famous as brilliant headers of the ball. We also had a Simon Harris interview last night. I expect the IRFU to follow government advice. He, uh, he menacingly menaced 
on the show last night. Um, and it's a disgrace, the words that were said about him, uh, David Brady talking about the personal abuse that Johnny Sexton suffered at the weekend. Uh, but don't feed the trolls. So, right, um, here's what's coming up for you. It's Brady himself talking about how he does hold a special place in his heart for the 1984 Inter Ballina Under-10 Town League. I always go back, and it's, it's... And people need to be very cognizant of it, and we're all... You were 14, you were 10. You were 10 years of age at one stage. And... William Butler Yeats, there's a poem, I don't know it, but I know the line, tread softly on my dreams. Mm. And for me, it, and I, 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 I say it, that it, the under 10 town league final, 1984, was the greatest sporting mm. event I was ever at. The town league final was Ballina split into four teams. United for Charles Pats. Mm. And the key. I played for the key. I'm from the key. Yeah. And I never, for me, there was, there must have been 88,000 people at it <laughs> as a 10 year old. Mm. But it, it lit something in me to say, you know what? We won two points to one. But I'm going back to tread softly on my dreams. My manager, my coach, the teacher in the school from the key school, St. Oliver Plunkus, where I went, was Hugh Lynn. Massive, massive influence. Mm. On, you, you can say your c career, but it's your life. We all have those people growing up, don't we? And you know what? The people that are in them situations do not realise the effect. No. They don't. No. We, we never go back and tell them. Oh. You, you got to a little bit with this, but most of us I never do. go back. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. The Sunday Paper Review on Off the Ball. When he wants to do something, he does it. A hugely imp impressive person, apart from being obviously a brilliant golfer. My cousins uh, disliked their dog so intensely that they renamed it Scalacci. Yeah. yeah. And the dog was called Scalacci from then on. It's a great piece of journalism. That sums up what he's like. The intro to this is just brilliant. He is an absolute control freak. Digesting the best stories on the back pages every Sunday afternoon on Off the Ball. OTB AM. Right, Trey, welcome back to OTB AM. We can have a quick look at the uh, top five stories that we're covering for you this morning before we get into uh, Graham Hunter. What have we got for you this morning, On? We will be uh, covering a lot of the Champions League stories this morning. We'll be getting into uh, the great work for Jim in Palestine. We'll have a guest on the line on that after nine o'clock this morning. We're going to talk about Irish rugby and an Paris. inkling of hope potentially on the horizon. Uh, Don Lennon talking about that. Troy Parrott, of course. Uh, as well, good uh, stuff with the Athletic this week uh, about uh, Parrot and uh, some insider information about whether or not uh, Spurs rate him in terms of his attitude. So uh, we'll get to that very shortly. Eight minutes past eight here on OTBAM. Let's join Graham Hunter and talk about last night's game with uh, Barcelona and Napoli and a bit about uh, tonight's game for Man City and uh, Real Madrid. Barcelona first last night. Um, how happy or otherwise are they going to be? I saw Dermot Corrigan on Twitter making the point that uh, Luis Suarez is very, very missed by the team at the moment. Well, why wouldn't he be? Um, not only is he an exceptional striker who, although September will bring five years since he scored an away goal in the Champions League, he is exceptional as a competitor. And one of the things that's been made ultra clear to me at Barcelona, and I wasn't as aware of when he was at Anfield or at Ajax, um, is that he's a technically superb player. And, and the, the cherry on the icing of all of that is that just at a time when Messi, um, lads, has... Um, has begun to play really strangely. Because if you look at the data, you look at the assists and the goals, and you say, yeah, everything's fine. You look at the play, and it's not. He, he's playing oddly, not not shambolically, um, but lacking precision, doing things that are very un -messy like There's no point in me comparing him to anybody else. So the, the, the yardstick is against Messi himself. So the number of times he'll pass straight to an opponent, unpressured, the number of times he'll run into a mob rather than skip clear or turn and release a pass or all the things, all the little deft solutions, sort of cat burglar solutions that we've seen Messi produce over the last 16 years on top of his goals and his trophies. These things have been going wrong since November. And he's just so good that he's produced a spate of um, assists, scored four at the weekend. Um, 
And therefore, Luis Suarez being absent at particularly this time is, is debilitating for Messi because he is without question the best strike partner Messi's ever had, club or international level. And, and he's had some phenomenal footballers and characters. But Suarez's innate understanding of what Messi needs, his ability to draw extra, um, how would you call it, fizz, extra competitive aggression out of Messi, these things are lacking. Dermot's quite right. And and your point about how happy will they be coming away from San Paulo in this state? Well, one, you, you sign for a 1-1 draw in just about any circumstances when you're in the nick that Barcelona has been in on the road. But, the, the you know, the headline result doesn't match the underlying trend. They were really poor in the first half. And Napoli found the rope-a-dope idea of what afterwards Busquets called to a bank of six and a bank of four. Really hard to break down. Barcelona couldn't find space. Junior isn't, he just is really aptly named because he isn't at Barcelona. He isn't at the Champions League level. He isn't at Barcelona's level. He's playing out of necessity. They shouldn't have bought him. He's witless. He's a good athlete and not much more. He made a terrible mistake for Napoli's goal. And therefore, to come away 1-1 and to dominate chunks of the second half and play significantly better, fine. But Busquets suspended, Arturo Vidal suspended, um, and, and a huge amount of energy outlaid until the point where PK limps off injured with the classical on Sunday means that it's it's... You know, they're not breaking out the bunting and hosting street parties back in Barcelona right now. Because this is a competition they could win at this point. You, you're looking around and kind of seeing there's a bit of stutter from Liverpool. There's, I ca there's, there's no reason why if they could just find you're a bit of form. You're Messi an idiot. You're picking a fight with wee Messi, Ger. I said he's off form. Um, uh, it doesn't mean that he's not listening to your programme as usual this morning. He said in a lengthy, lengthy interview, I mean, really, six pages, in Mundo Deportivo last week, we're not in shape to win the Champions League. And he's right. I mean, if you look at the personnel uh, on, a, on a really odd year, maybe, form, uh, the absence of um, Dembele, for sure out for the season, likely that Suarez doesn't play until late May at the earliest. Did, did they look like Champions League winners? No, if the others were, were blindfolded and their laces tied together, maybe. Um, and, and Messi's point, you know, he, he elaborated by saying we have to cut out the absolute, he said the tonterias, the crazy, not just mistakes, the crazy mistakes we've been making all year. And who was listening last night? Junior, was he listening? No, he wasn't. Gave the ball away for the 1-0 goal. Arturo Vidal, the guy who's replaced Suarez and Messi's affections, by which I mean they play really well together. They look for each other all the time. Vidal set up a lovely assist at the weekend against Debar for, for Messi. Vidal goes, you know, head-to-head. -head. I forget the opponent. Apologies. I should be able to name you the opponent. Goes head-to-head. And, and gets himself sent off in, in a crazy fashion, can't play in the return leg. Crazy mistake? Yes, another one. Ger, I know that when Stegen's playing well and if PK's on form and if, you know, De Jong finds a little bit of ability to break lines and, and Ansu's a miracle worker and Messi does what Messi does, then, you know, maybe your proposition doesn't sound like fantasy, but right now, having seen what I've seen in recent months, I'm... I'm I'm right. calling you a fantasist. All right, OK. Nice, nice to have a bit of fantasy in your life from time to time. Mm. Yeah, because... Not, uh, not that kind. <laughs> it's, it's interesting having that perspective because I think a lot of people would look at the basic process of the fact that they possibly should have been in the Champions League final last year, blew it completely against Liverpool, and there hasn't been a wild turnover of personnel. Obviously, Coutinho starting that day and Suarez's injury, and as far as injury is a huge thing, but obviously, from what you're saying, it goes beyond that. It goes beyond uh, the, the personnel differences this year. There's just a, a malaise in the camp to take him to that level of being within a hair of making the Champions League final. Look on... Um, uh, OK, if, if you use that as your, as your sort of yardstick again, the Anfield performance, and you compare it to Rome, uh, there's now been two long and thoughtful um, expositions by PK and Messi about we don't know what happened. We haven't got rid of those wounds. So you can change personnel, you can change coach, you can change your ideas. But two things call out to me. If the squad really don't know what happened in Rome, 
when they turned around a 4-1 victory into a, an aggregate 4-4 away goals elimination. And then when they they snuck past Liverpool at Camp Nou, the 3-0 uh, result was brilliantly carved out. The goals were wonderful. Dembele missed a sitter for 4-0. But at Anfield, they weren't simply beaten. They, they, they should be embarrassed by the way in which they were out-competed, they were out-run, they were dopey, really dopey. Now, Liverpool, my respect for them goes up, even though I'm using that word to describe their opponents, because they went, yeah, we see you. We see you. The Emperor's got no clothes. We're on you. They mauled them. And and they should be embarrassed, Barcelona, for having left Messi so stranded. Messi gave one of, maybe not one of his great performances, but a great performance at Anfield. He nearly put Barcelona through on his own. If you if you talk to the players, which I have, sub, the Liverpool players, subsequently, they're left in awe of what Messi did that night. And therefore, you know, to pick up on your theme, have they corrected any of those things? No. You know, they don't seem able to understand that they were asleep mentally, that they allowed themselves to be pummeled two years in a row. They haven't corrected any of the, the training ground habits, which is nothing more than just a, a failure to recognise that other clubs have... We, we, this is what we talked about last time. Other clubs have upped the search for footballing intensity and Barcelona have failed to realise that's what's going on around them. They're training at the same level, I think, that made them great. When they had greater players, they were younger, when there was more cohesion, when they were coached in a different manner. And and therefore, they're not slacking. They've just been caught out. And therefore, you know, I, I don't think there's been a sufficient change of personnel, a change of thinking, nor has there been a change of of, of fitness personnel. Because it's it's not like they're... they're you know, they, they've chucked it. It's just that they, they've been caught sleeping while other clubs have moved on in a different direction. OK, speaking of um, <clears throat> the other game last night, briefly before we talk to you about the game tonight, I, I know obviously you were covering the Barcelona game, so probably having a, a chance to sift through exactly all the details of the Bayern Munich game. But Bayern Munich went to Chelsea and were clearly the better team. Are Bayern Munich thinking about themselves in a, a way that they're like, actually, you know what, we're coming into a bit of form here. Uh, we're, we're getting a proper competition in the Bundesliga, and this is one of those seasons where we should think of them as proper potential Champions League winners. I didn't, I would admit. Um, I was listening to Karl-Heinz Rummenigge the other day talk about Hansi Flick and talk about the way in which it's now, in their view, a much more recognisable Bayern Munich. That Bayern Munich are playing with the power, with the intensity, with the confidence that can um, see them swamping sides. And the other thing that would that would argue in in your favour for your proposition again would be that um, in the majority over the years that I've been watching, never mind writing about football, the teams that win the Champions League are the ones that have a Pavlovian response to the midweek games where it's the elite against the elite, and they're like, "Yeah, we're up for this," irrespective of how we played last Saturday or how we're going to play next Sunday. This is our tournament, and and. It, it, you don't have to always be like that. Sometimes sides win it because there's a paucity of opposition or because they're absolutely, unbelievably out of sight. But what unites Manchester United, Bayern Munich, Ajax, uh, Milan, Barcelona in my lifetime has been the, yeah, we hear the bell, we're hungry. And, and Bayern Munich have that right now. Do I think that they're outright favourites? No, I look at how they struggle domestically. I've watched a game against Paderborn, uh, which they win 3-2, and, and they, they weren't particularly good. Does the Chelsea result flatter them in context of winning the tournament? I think it does. Chelsea, a, a young team, uh, missing key players, and, and I, I'm, I'm not a fan of one or two of the players that Frank Lampard selected last night. I think it's, it's given Bayern Munich a, a, a sheen that they might not deserve. But at this stage of the competition, if you find power and momentum and everybody's fit and Thiago's playing like he does and Neuer doesn't have one of his brain freezes, then they're in the mix. Yes, they're in the mix. Do I fancy them to win it outright? No, I don't. You talk about teams hearing the bell and hearing the Champions League music. The, the best example of that over the last decade and a half have always been Real Madrid, I would say. Like, by miles. Right, by and, miles. And they are outsiders to go through against Manchester City over the two legs. I find this remarkable. Like, I don't even think we're, uh, uh, Manchester City are playing that well at the moment. I just think that, I can't understand. Okay, so Eden Hazard got injured at the weekend and that's kind of poo-pooed my 
confidence a little bit. But I think, I, like, this is the bell is ringing and it got Real Madrid absolutely up for this game against Pep Guardiola. Look, um, Ger, I, I would, uh, up until recently, I, I would have agreed with you. I felt that the, the Real Madrid's mindset, irrespective of the fact that they're a little short of killer goals, that they're on top of games, and in, for a couple of months now, they've been getting through 1-0, 2-1, 2-0, when it should be game out of sight. We can rest players, we can rotate the squad, we've killed this game. That's something that they've been lacking. And up until recently, I thought that their mindset, that their quality in midfield when they play Modric, Casemiro, Valverde, Cruz, I, I thought that would be sufficient because um, you're right, they are Pavlovian. They, it, it, it it still changes them. It, it it catalyzes them when they get greeted by the fans the way that Atleti were, had to, you know, were gingered up by the massive reception from their fans outside the Metropolitano. And they caught a slightly toothless Liverpool because of the winter break. But that, that, the way in which the fans lay their soul out in front of you and say, don't let us down, give us everything from a mile away from the stadium all the way to the stadium. That affects continental teams hugely. I don't have the same experience of that in Britain. It happens, but not in the same way. It's not part of the culture. And it happens to Madrid. And I did think that overall that they would they would win this tie. And, and you know, I'd value your and Owen's opinion rather than the market because the market is set by where people put their money. And people often put their money based on hunches or suppositions rather than form. The two things that, that concern me now, and I think change the, the, the level of this part of the tie, is one, I have no doubt whatsoever that some of the things that Pep Guardiola has been trying to transmit to his players over his reign at City about Europe is more important, Europe matters, we have to, he doesn't have to do that anymore because of the ban. I think there are, there are scintillas of difference between a side that can win this big trophy and, and should win it or, or is empowered to win it. I think the ban will affect City positively. I really genuinely do. It, it, there, there was, in quality terms, there was very little between the two sides. And another small point I think makes Real Madrid slightly less favourites for this part of the tie is that suddenly after the brilliant work of Gregory Dupont, a fitness man, which has made them unrecognisable from autumn, where they've been outlasting teams, where they've been running through blocks, they've been running, they've been breaking lines, they're running beyond, they've been covering for one another. There's been just one of these imperceptible, and I don't mean massive, but imperceptible dips that strip them of some of their intensity. And therefore they go into this tie, um, they need to hear the bell, they really do. And City have an opportunity, and I think, Best guess tonight in the Bernabeu where it'll be it'll be extraordinary atmosphere. Best guess is a score draw. And Madrid, either of the other either sides have got the, the capacity to win it by a goal. I think score draw. I think Madrid dangerous in Manchester. But I think the balance has changed over the last two, three weeks. Graham, great to have you with us this morning. Enjoy the game tonight. Thanks a million. Thanks, fellas. Graham Hunter, uh, I hope it's uh, helping you salivate ahead of what should be an epic game tonight in uh, Bernabeu Real Madrid against uh, Manchester City kicks off at 8 o'clock updates across the evening on Off the Ball now Virgin Media have over 400 UEFA Champions League Europa League and Nations League games live this season all of these games are available to all Virgin Media TV customers you can also download the TV Anywhere app and stream the action whenever and wherever they like last night Brian Kerr made the case that Barcelona are still too reliant on Leo Messi have a look Yes, um, I mean, you know, he did the stuff in the home match with Liverpool. He got two goals in the first leg, he won three nothing, and looked like the job was done. It was hard to see them losing again, having lost to Roma, losing a three-goal lead against Roma also the previous season at the same stage. So, uh, yes, there is an over-dependence on him. I mean, if you win three nothing at home and Messi scores two goals and sets up the other one, well, then, you know, you depend on the rest of the team. Now, all you've got to do is keep this lot out and don't concede three or four away from home. And they weren't good enough to do that. They fell apart against Liverpool. They were overawed. The occasion, the, 
the, the, the intensity of Liverpool's play on the night. But it was the second year in a row that it happened at Rome as well. So, you know, I, I, I think he's been let down. The quality of the players he's playing with aren't as good as the players that that we talked about. We've talked about previously the days of Xavi and Iniesta. It's 2015 now since they won it. So this is year five. They've had to look at Real Madrid, Liverpool winning it and, and, and seem to be going Nick, towards a bit of dominance. There's still a bit to do yet. Liverpool, they might go out themselves this year. Nick, but it would have annoyed them watching Real Madrid. Yeah, that's uh, Brian Kerr speaking last night on Virgin Media Sport. Top five stories we're covering for you this morning. Troy Parrott, some details emerging from sources within Spurs. We'll get you details on that. Donald Lennon, very positive about the future of Irish rugby, the underage uh, teams coming through. A wide geographical spread of new talent across all the provinces as well. Kean Healy out for the rest of the Six Nations um, Champions League games tonight. We already talked a bit about them with Graham Hunter and Ackley Palestine. Uh, Owen, where are we starting? Let's start with Troy Parrott. Piece in The Athletic, uh, joint byline between Charlie Eccleshare and David Ornstein, shedding some light on Troy Parrott's current situation at Tottenham Hotspur. So, sources, I'm going to quote the piece here just for this paragraph. Sources have told The Athletic that there have been questions over Parrott's mentality and application of late. Others have registered surprise at the striker's apparent immaturity especially when surrounded by his mates. Mourinho, meanwhile, appeared to suggest the player lacks emotional control last week. Though, again, it's worth remembering Parrot has only just turned 18. Like... 18-year-old gone at 18. Yeah. Uh, there is... Who, so, you know, bear in mind, last week, Redknapp came out and Chris Waddle came out and they both said that their sources within the club yeah. are suggesting this guy's the real deal, put him in the team. Yeah. So renowned former ex-players who hold sway with the fans are, are saying this. And afterwards, a counter-argument emerges which throws questions on the kid's temperament and his application and what he's like with his mates. Yes. So, always when these stories come out, ask yourself... What's the motive? What's the motive? Who are the sources? Who benefits from this? Does Jose Mourinho benefit from this? I think yes, he does. I think it's pretty clear that that's the case. So that's kind of why I wanted to quote that uh, opening paragraph rather than saying uh, this has given us information that might be able to help us form an opinion. I'm just saying that this has been... Sources have said that this is the opinion within Tottenham Hotspur. Um, so obviously the situation with him going on loan couldn't happen because he needed to stay uh, at the club until this month be so to be considered a homegrown player. Uh, so it was in Tottenham's interest to ensure that he stayed. Parrot was frustrated with that. In fairness, I can see both sides of that coin. I can see Tottenham, they're paying him to be at the club. They want to make him a homegrown player. Like, it makes sense. Well, long, long term, it's a much better benefit for him to be homegrown. Because... It, and for Parrot as well. Yeah. And uh, also, I can see why Parrot would similarly be a little bit frustrated by what's going on at the moment. Uh, apparently, he's not been given any explanation as to why he's not being picked for Tottenham at the moment. This is an unusual, not even in a Spurs sense. Uh, Josie does this quite a bit. Harry Winks says that he wasn't given an explanation why he wasn't involved at the start. But also Maurizio Pochettino used to also uh, not uh, be entirely forthcoming with certain explanations for players when they were being uh, left out. So um, it's just an interesting thing that's been that's come up this morning. It's like what we continue to hear talk from club legends and from people who are very well connected about this guy's incredible talent. This if if. He signed for the club initially a month earlier and he became fully homegrown in the middle of January. He would probably be on loan somewhere at the moment and we would start to see Troy Parrott. We just need to make it to the summer. Like Whether or not if Ireland qualified, he'd be in the Euro 2020 squad though is uh, no chance, different, yeah. different yeah. question altogether. So uh, that's what's going on with Troy Parrott. Uh, that's the piece in the Athletic. Okay. Uh, next up this morning we're talking Keane Healy. Uh, injury obviously it's like a, a huge doubt for... Uh, the Saracens game at this point, let alone the, the rest of the Six Nations. Dave Kilcoyne will come in and actually uh, take up that position. Um, like you're, you're, you're thinking to yourself, if the Italy game had happened, would we have had an entirely different front row, regardless of injuries, for, for people to try out? You suspect we probably would have. Yeah, because Andrew Porter is worth the shot at this stage. He definitely played well when he came on, obviously got his first try for Ireland. Keller's. Keller is the obvious. Yeah. Uh, and obviously now this is going to be enforced. So we, we could see an entirely different front row, even if it is uh, for the France game. I would say with Furlong and Porter, I know you were making the case before the Six Nations that Porter perhaps deserved his chance. Uh, I think that uh, it's probably the closest one to call, but I think Kelleher will have to be thrown in and now Kilcoyne is going to get uh, his opportunity. Uh, like in terms of some of the hope that's going around, Leith might, might pass me the examiner there this morning. Like, so just one thing about Keane Healy, he's yeah. got 98 caps. Yeah. So needs two more to join the Centurion Club, which is a massive achievement 
in in rugby to to be durable enough. He's uh, 32. He's 33 in October. So you really hope his um, fitness returns in time for him to get on the tour to Australia, and then he picks up his hundred caps because he deserves it. So Donald Ellington is saying Friday night's win over England in the under 20s is the best display by an Irish team he's ever seen at this level, uh, which is big talk indeed. Like obviously won the Grand Slam this year, have already won the Triple Crown this year on course for another Grand Slam. Naturally, you're saying these players are very, very exciting. But what Lennon's actually saying here is that it's the manner in which they're playing which should have us uh, most exciting. That uh, most excited that the, the offloading out of the tackle, in particular, is something that these uh, youngsters are being coached in. Um, the, he said we saw that last year. We saw great footwork, hands beyond the tackle, uh, as I say. And he mentions that this summer's tour to Australia, kind of in a different sense here, affords uh, the chance for Andy Farrell to bring in a few youngsters. He probably means more last year's on the 20 side. Obviously, this year's crop is a, a bit too young. Like we, we were seeing Caelan Doris, who was obviously a star on the 20 level only a few years ago, uh, ready made and good to go at, at the top level. These players are being coached extremely well at the moment. They'll have come from a culture of being successful, but also a culture of playing rugby that might be conducive to the future success of Irish rugby, which is, we now realise we are not going to be able to, to win a World Cup or even get to a World Cup semi-final, let's face it, with our traditional power game. Because when England are on song, when South Africa are on song, when New Zealand are on song, they will smash us if we try to smash them. It just won't happen. Like what we saw, the template we saw last year was in Shizuoka when Japan played around us and outsmarted us. Uh, that if we do have this uh, rugby resource, which is the, the schools game in Ireland, but coached in a way where that power is actually combined with a bit of guile, with a good offloading game, we might actually be able to find our way in a position where we can beat some of these big teams when it really matters. And the size advantage that England and France have traditionally held at under 20 level was something that we thought we weren't going to be able to overcome but here it turns out there is a template for it. Exactly and it turns out that the, that question mark about not being able to overcome that power at underage level is replicated itself at senior level now. Like We've seen it three times in the last 13 months getting pummeled by England and it's the manner in which we're losing these games. Like I mean I, people give out about like the jargon about like not getting over the gain line and dominant tackles and all that but I think that's gone from jargon to the centre point of Irish rugby's crisis at the moment, really. It's, uh, it's definitely it is, transcended uh, uh, the niche rugby talk. That, that's why the notion of um, there being an overreaction to this defeat, in my mind, has been complete nonsense. Their, their reaction to this defeat has been, we have now come up against the same team three times and been absolutely annihilated three, three times in the same manner. The definition of insanity is to continue to do the same action and expect a different outcome, right? It's one of the definitions of insanity. It's a bit insane for us to continue doing the same thing with the same players and the same team and the same ambition against an England team who have worked us out and who showed the template to the rest of the world. The same thing happened this in um, the game against Wales last year in the Six Nations. Now, for some reason, Wales didn't try the same thing against us this year because they've got a new coach who's like, well, actually, I'm trying my own stuff here. But there's a template out there for teams to beat us. And unless we do something differently, we're going to continue to get beaten. That's why the reaction has been so, well, this is a bit of a disaster. England are better than us and will now have uh, a production line of players who are fairly similar physically, athletically and ball skills who can just swat us away every time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, like in terms of some of the other changes then, just to kind of uh, wrap up some of the rugby pieces this morning, like as, as I mentioned, um, Darcy writing about the potential changes that needed to happen. He, he's calling for a back row uh, overhaul. Like he's saying, uh, Stander, O'Mahony, van der Fleer, sit them and have a look at uh, Doris, Max Deegan and, and Will O'Connors. Like or Jack O'Donoghue. Or Jack O'Donoghue, I think, perhaps would be a, be a better fit. Um, like if he's showing better than any of the Leinster trio training, put him in is what uh, he says. He'd also say, suggest a change of fullback if Will Addison was fit and then floats this idea of potentially Stockdale at fullback again. But... Uh, I like the idea of Addison at fullback, like we said it a couple of weeks ago with, um, with Larimer and Conway on the wings, but some reshuffle in that position is probably going to be needed and required at this point. Laments the absence of Gary Ringrose as well as a, a more creative midfielder, but like then again, I know he was our best player at the World Cup, but he was still there during our World Cup disaster. All right, um, we've got shot clock with Kieran Donnelly up next. First though, let's hear from Damien Delaney. Despite three goals in the past week, he's just not convinced by Anthony Martial. I seriously dislike that guy. Why? I just do. You think he's? I think he's lazy. Do you? I do. And is that uh, extremely uh, lazy? Inconsistent. Uh, uh, a better word. 
looks a bit like he, he, he does look disinterested at times. That always that doesn't always mean he is though. Okay, well, what's his? I mean, he, I can't work him out either. He, 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 listen, for the player he thinks he is, or, or no, sorry, that's unfair. Um, he's not as good as what everyone says he is. I mean, he's good moments and he does some great things, mm -hmm. but he almost looks like he's got a chip on his shoulder. He's he's, he's upset about something. He doesn't do enough for me. Uh, he's lazy, and the fact that Saucer came out a couple of weeks ago and said, "Oh, he's top of the running stats. His running has gone through the roof uh, since I've been manager." I mean, straight away I'd go, well, what was he doing beforehand? Did he just not want to run around? And now you're patting him on the back for running around? Mm. I mean, and then, by the way, that was at the time where they gave him a rest. Well, he's been running around a lot, so we're going to give him a rest. Do I we... just went, honestly, my head just nearly exploded. I was like, oh, my God. You're a tough taskmaster. No, I just think, come on, man, that should be the minimum. Non-negotiable. Okay, okay, it's hard to argue Run with around, that. It's hard to argue with that. It's hard to argue you with that. I mean? There was a chat, I remember uh, Gary Neville and Roy Keane on Super Sunday one day after Martial had played very well one day. And they were talking about him. And it was interesting. Neville sort of said, I'm really confused on Martial. Mm. Because it just feels like it really needs to start happening for him soon. Yeah. Very soon. And yet, he strikes me as still a player who could leave and come back to haunt the club. Like, there's, there is a real talent in there. Now, Keane was a bit more dismissive. Keane said, ain't going to happen. It's done. Like, it's not no, going to happen. No, I, I, I think it, it, it possibly could. I mean, you know, because you're right, there is a player in there. But at what point, like that was well, that was Neville's question, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know. And what he's been point. there long enough now, and he just looks like it's a chore for him. That's the best way because it looks like oh, I'll do it today, but you know, I'll give you a little bit, but and be happy with that. And I'm just going, how does he escape so much criticism? Mm. And people, from what I see, still seem to go, oh, no, Tony Martial is this and that, and I'm going, if he played for Watford, you'd go, yeah, he's got moments, he's, yeah. he's decent. Manchester United, I'm sorry, Manchester United is not about moments. I mean, this is 50 games a season, please. And that's what we paid 50 million quid for when he was a teenager and an unproven player. Yeah. You know? All right, it's time for the shot clock here on OTBAM. Some friendly competition is broadcasting's equivalent of John Cooney versus Conor Murray. It is Ger Gilroy against Kieran Donaghy. Uh, we've got three topics for debate, then on to Kieran's free throw and then on to this week's picks. If you make a good argument, you will hear this sound. And if you make a bad argument, you will hear this sound. And uh, basically, at my discretion, throughout, Kieran Donaghy is on the line. Ger is here in studio. And we are starting uh, with Irish rugby. This idea of ruthlessness versus loyalty. Is there any room for loyalty, Kieran, after the disaster at the Aviva Stadium at the weekend? Twickenham. Uh, I think there is. I think there's room for loyalty. Look, uh, you know, the big talk is, is whether about Johnny Sexton. He's our captain. You have to go with him. You have to let him play through this bit of... Um, uh, a bit of a dip in form. Look, he did have a poor game at Twickenham. Look, he'll know that himself. I think everybody watching will know that. But, you know, I was captain of Kerry in 2015. Uh, I was dropped. Um, you know, I felt I shouldn't have been. And I felt, you know, very similar in this line with, with Johnny. Johnny needs to be given this chance to, to, to come good and to lead us back into this French game. Obviously, Italy is a doubt if it's going to be on in two weeks. But to, to to be there in this French game, I think it's 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 essential that Johnny Sexton is there, and and I wouldn't drop him. Look, there is there's loyalty. I would say definitely comes into play with the captaincy uh, and and the player that's captain. But I would say with the others, I'd say people are up for grabs at this stage. Why were you dropped? Uh, my my farm wasn't really good. My farm wasn't really good, at, um, and you know probably very similar to the to the Sexton. Um, conundrum that the Irish management are facing now and uh, I felt after the game that it was you know uh, it was the wrong call um, but it's, it's, a, it's a call that had to be made at that given time and it was hard because you know we did have an unbelievable full forward line in James, Paul Ganey and Gooch but just um, you know I, I felt I felt I needed to be in there. Did you have it out with Eamon? Did he tell you in advance? How did that conversation go? Um... Did I have it out with him? Do you know what? At the time, I took it, you know, the decision's made. You're not going to change the manager's mind if he comes and tells you you're not on the team for the final. But, um, you know, I, I, I just took it that I was going to be in there when the game was in the melting pot and uh, that I was going to be able to influence it later on, which 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 when I came on, uh, you know, I did bits and pieces and, and we nearly got a, a found way back into the game. But it was... Um, it, 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 it was kind of gone and I, and I feel for you know a player like Sexton who's had a, a really tough game last week he was really good against Wales let's not forget that but he was poor last week and uh, I feel like you just need to stick with him and you need him to you need him to lead you 
uh, through the through the the Italy game and 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 ramp it up for the French game and and, and he's your guy like you don't know how much of a spiritual leader this guy is in the dressing room you know he's incredible by all accounts and uh, I think dropping him would be would be would be a mistake. Yeah, I 100% agree with this, that you can't drop Sexton for the France game. He had a terrible game, but he needs to be given the opportunity on the basis of all of the recoveries that he's made ever up to this point. He is the best out half we have. He's also the best out half we have by a country mile. None of the rest of the players who are in the squad or who are outside the squad at the moment who are fit are actually close to pushing him out of the team. So not only does he have to stay in because he's your captain and spiritual leader, he has to stay in because he's your best number 10. The issue at number yeah. 9 is different. There, the loyalty has to be to the player who's pushing through, where the, the gap has closed to the point where we need to see what Cooney can do. And I think this actually has an impact on 10 as well. There's no way you could go with Cooney and Ross Byrne to start for their first big Six Nations game together for the first time in Paris. That would be absolute madness. What you've got to do is give Cooney the opportunity with uh, and potentially Caelan Doris start at eight. So you would have a new eight, new nine, new 10. Makes absolutely no sense. You can have Doris at eight and Sexton at 10 and have Cooney at nine come in and, and actually let's see what he can do. Let's face it, he's going to be up against a French side where physically Dupont's not going to run over him. He's not going to be uh, beaten by the opposition scrum half. They have big beasts in the French back row, so you're going to actually ask him to physically front up. Physically fronting up was not one of the issues that Sexton had against England, by the way. His defence was very good. So what we're saying here is fix the yips, the kicking yips that you've had. He's going to have another week to do it now because he's not going to be playing. There's going to be no game against France, against Italy, and, uh, yeah. and make sure that you're passing and all the rest of that stuff. Your eye is back in. And let's see what impact having a different scrum half is going to have on him. Yeah, I think he can change. I think I think Cooney can can bring a bit of uh, a bit of bit of a bit of a spark to the team and a bit of unpredictability. I would say and something different. And and you know, look, Ireland need to to do something. You know, there's there's and it's and it's more than and it's more than Conor Murray who's who's going to be under pressure for for the French game at this stage. So, for sure. Um, I, I think we gotta I think we gotta freshen it up and take take that chance because um. You got to realize how strong England are. Like they were in a World Cup. Look, they went over to France and they were completely hoodwinked. But into that game, they were completely caught off the boil. The Scotland game was was a joke. If you, I watched it. It was a, it was a game in a hurricane where nobody could really play uh, and show themselves. And but England, the last day, look, were just incredible. So uh, they're World Cup, the World Cup finalists. So I, you know, I, I think we have to realize where we are as well, and realize that that was always going to be tough to go to Twickenham. And we both picked yeah. England on, on shot clock last week, and 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 I think this French game is is one that we can really go after and try and just restore that bit of that bit of joy to the Irish rugby fan at the moment. No terrible arguments in there. No negative points uh, scored just yet. You're racing out in front at the time being, uh, but we are going to turn our attention to Gaelic games. Galway with a humongous win <laughs> at the weekend against Tyrone, despite the fact that Tyrone uh, had uh, two men sent off. Jerry might lead us off on this one. Legitimate All-Ireland contenders, Galway? Yeah, 100%. We, we've seen Galway build a defensive structure under Kevin Welch over the last number of years, and they came in for massive criticism for the fact that they didn't have the attacking prowess to match it and that they were keeping the shackles on some great attacking players. I, at the time, I didn't actually understand that their attacking players were so good. It did take Porrick Joyce coming in and very simply identifying what is at the core of... Galway football. This is something that we've talked about a lot on the show and whether or not it actually exists. What is Corkness, for example? It turns out Galway football has a brand and it goes all the way back to the team in the 50s and 60s and the, the team that erupted in 98 played some of the best football you've ever seen because they gave a bunch of youngsters, 521s on that team in 98, they gave them their head. Suddenly Jaff Fallon became Jaff Fallon, able to kick points from either touchline. And it's that, that level of confidence that the superstar in that midst Porrick Joyce has brought to this team and has given Shane Walsh, who it turns out now is like nailed on as a contender for Footballer of the Year in February. Who knew that it was possible to do that? Not supposed to be able to do that, but look at the, the joy that he's bringing to that team and that county and think about the, the rolling ball of confidence that all those forwards have in having the offensive mind of Porrick Joyce right there. I'm not sure that they're going to put it up to Dublin in a big game this year, but certainly in the next 18 months, this is a team that's going to build and layer on the confidence that the attacking prowess that they've shown is coming off the back of all the good work that Kevin Walsh did by making them a super defensive team. So this is the same evolution that Donegal went through, although Donegal managed it in the space of two years from where they frustrated everybody with that game famously against Dublin when they had 16 men behind the ball. 
um, and then the next season they had attacking fullbacks. This year we're seeing Galway eventually break out of the defensive structures that they had placed, but using them and being able to fall back on them when they need to. Absolutely all Ireland contenders. Yeah, yeah, I, I really think they are. I really think they're going to push it this year. I think, I think the the playing of Johnny Heaney at number four is 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 huge for them. He's um he scored two goals this year, um he's bombing on from cornerback. He's bringing that you know you just said there about the Donegal full back line driving forward in their evolution. That's happening now with Galway as well. Sean Mulcairn is a, is a great fit at full back. Ronan Steed showed last week three massive points in the middle of the field. Uh, Paul Conroy coming back would be an unbelievable partner for him. The two of them have great footballing minds. Uh, you also have Mordecai Finn lads who are, who, are being, who are being shuffled back into the deck here. But I think the big thing is Comer out at centre forward too. You know, uh, looking at the Tyrone game the last day, they kept everybody out wide. The two corner forwards and the two half forwards were practically on the touchline and they wanted to create as much space down the middle for Comer and Shane Walsh. There's nobody, including Dublin or Kerry or anybody else, that's going to want to be one-on-one with Damien Comer and, and, and Shane Walsh on a pitch, especially not in Crow Park. And when this Galway team get to Crow Park, they're going to even be able to express themselves that bit more. Um, they are legitimate contenders. Their form has proven they should have beaten Kerry and Killarney. Nobody's ever beaten Tyrone like that uh, in, in the National League. Mickey Hart's worst defeat in his career. Um, and, and look, they went up to Donegal against a really good Donegal team and, 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 and really put it up to them and, and beat them as well, even though Michael Murphy did miss a free late on to win it. But they're also eking out these results. They have the pain of the one point last to Kerry. They have the ecstasy of that massive one point. Way win above it. They are going to roll through the summer um, and, and build up more momentum. But the test will be that when people come up with a plan and double team and triple team and, and sure up as uh, their own Shane Walsh, what will be the answer for that? And I'm sure Parik Joyce and his management team will be working on it, but they are certainly contenders. They are class footballers all over the pitch. And I think, you know, you get the rest of the core of Finn lads in and 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 they're they're they are really legitimate. I think I think I think they can on a one off game, I think they can beat I think they can beat a double they can beat anyone, one off game uh, if, if things go their way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there, there's still no crappy arguments made so far. Hey. So you're playing the game this week, Ger Gilroy, basically copying and pasting one of my tweets into what he's actually saying. That is how you earn points on the shot clock. Very, very impressed this morning, lads. Uh, final talking point in the debate section of the shot clock this morning. Dean Rock, he turns 30 today. He's coming into the autumn of his career, but he, he'll be he around for a bit from. longer, I, I dare say. Is, is there a chance we've actually underappreciated Dean Rock all this time, Kieran? Like, I mean, obviously, uh, as a free take, no. he's always front and centre. You're saying no. No. Dean Rock is not underappreciated by anybody that knows football and anybody that can appreciate how important uh, a person is to a team. Dean Rock is in this Dublin attack. Every time somebody folds a Dublin player, Dean Rock steps up and bangs it over. He's won them all Ireland. He is uh, improved... Um, um, in his play, in his general play as well for Dublin. Yeah, he's not, you know, taking guys on, but he's coming on the loop. He's kicking scores, and he's an absolute constant in the team. There's no way he's a constant like he is in that team just because he's able to take frees. They've got loads of forwards that can kick frees. They've got the Carmel Costellos. They've got Dear McConnellys. They've got loads of guys that. Can I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump in here while we fix the uh, the ISDN uh, the uh, sky button. Because hang on a second, Dean Rock has two All Stars. He's never been in the conversation for footballer of the year. And by the time his career is over, he's going to be the highest scorer in Championship football. He's like on the verge of taking over uh, Bernard Brogan. I think he's got another 34 points or something according to the Indo this morning to um, to take over um, Jimmy Keaveney. This is a sensational career that Dean Rock is putting together. As, as Dublin's all-time uh, scorer. This is an absolutely amazing career, and we never talk about Dean Rock in the same breath as any of those amazing Dublin footballers that are always in the conversation for football of the year. Nobody compares him with Brian Fenton, nobody compares him with Jack McCaffrey, nobody compares him with Dear McConley, but what he has managed to do is bring an effortless effortlessness and a calm and a coolness to the biggest moments in the biggest games, and we just expect that as a matter of course, he's going to ping it over from the left touch line. He's going to ping it over from 40 yards when the pressure is absolutely on. I think, I actually do think that we need to appreciate this a little bit more because we say, ah, it's only free-taking. But free-taking is boring hours of repetition 
in the hail and the rain and the wind and the darkness in the winter months to make sure that when it comes down to it in Croke Park, you've got somebody you can do it. And you think of the other counties who've had freeze to win or to push games into extra time who haven't been able to do it in recent seasons when Dublin have been. And you think it's a matter of interest that separates us. A scintilla was the phrase that Graham Hunter used earlier on. And that is greatness. But we don't appreciate it because it's only free-taking, Maria. Yeah, but like the question was, is he underappreciated? And the answer is that he's not. Like that's that's the simple answer for it. This guy is like, you know, yeah, he's not doing what Brian Fenton does in the middle of the field. Like Brian Fenton is bossing games from minute one to, 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 to minute minute one to minute minute seventy. He bosses the games. He doesn't have the brilliance of Dermot Connolly and the power and, and the fluidity when he's on the ball and when he's running. That's different. He doesn't have the speed of Jack McCaffrey. He's a halfback. We can't compare him to that. He's a free taker. He does his job. I know we team. don't, and we don't value the free taking as much as we should do. I'm saying that, like, if if Kildare had a had somebody like if Kerry had somebody who was hitting the same level of. Free I don't know who doesn't value the free taking though. Tell me Mayo, who doesn't value if it. If Mayo had somebody who'd kick freeze the way Dean Rock did, they might have won a lot along the way. Well, I, Killian, I I'd argue against that as well. I think Killian O'Connor is a pretty good free taker. Um, uh, Just those two I, famous I, ones he missed. Yeah, well, like that's you can't, you know, it, it's hard to judge a guy on, on missing two. But Dean Rock doesn't miss him, is my point. Or yeah, almost well, he missed, never. He missed one last year. Almost never. He, he missed one last year. I don't he know. Does, he doesn't miss there. too many. He doesn't miss too many. No. He doesn't miss. He, he's he's giving you a minus point because you said he never missed one when he missed that's one it, last I'm, year to win I'm, the first game. I'm giving you a minus point, Kieran, because you said he can't do what Brian Fenton does in midfield, despite catching the best mark of the season last year in, in the middle Hold of the park on, for no. Dublin. I'm not on about catching marks, I'm on about <laughs> Brian Fenton bossing games, is what I said, running games. It's I can just, I can just stay stone here and I'm going to win this whole thing. It's a joke, i got a minus point for that. Uh, Kieran, you finish up on, what are we looking at here? Free uh, throw. Five points, and uh, Jerry, you've actually uh, crushed them this week, I think. Woo! Yeah, you've, two uh, all, maybe. Seven, I think seven five or eight five, something like that today. It doesn't matter, uh, Jerry. It is two all in the debate section. Uh, but on to the free throw uh, this week, here, and uh, it is on to the clutch dubs. Uh, clutch City, Houston Rockets in the mid nineties is the comparison you want to make. I want to ask you, who's the Hakeem Olajuwon of this Dublin team? Uh, Brian Fenton is the Hakeem Olajuwon of this Dublin team because he's the man in the middle and he is unflappable and nobody can touch him. Pretty much like the Hakeem, the dream Olajuwon. Yeah, Clutch City, look, it was a, 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 a phrase that was coined in, in 95 when these guys kept going, making the big plays. When Michael Jordan was playing his baseball, the Houston Rockets won two playoffs back-to-back, -back, two national championships. Uh, they were slated for being chokers a bit before that, but they came good. Um, sort of like this Dublin team, you know, would have been would have been uh, viewed like that until, until they broke through in 2011. And ever since then... They are the clutch city. They are GA's clutch city. Um, how often do, they, do we uh, watch them stare down the barrel of defeat and, and come out laughing laughing in the face of it? You can go back to the semi-final uh, against Mayo in 2015. Down, five, down four or five points with 12 minutes to go. They win by seven. They grind it out the final against Kerry the following three weeks later. 2016 against semi, losing again late on to Kerry. They get back level. It's level in the 70th minute. They go on and win by seven. The 16 final, they're down by four with 13 minutes to go, and they win by seven against Mayo. Uh, the 17 final, they, Mayo over free to win it, the one Jura has just been talking about. They miss. Dublin come up and get a chance. They don't miss. They've got the... Pre they've got the 18 was easy. It was a piece of cake. But 2019 was their greatest clutch moment ever when they were... Looked like all... They were beating all ends up. They were a pint down. They were a man down. They're into the 72nd minute. Their five in a row dreams are going up and going up in smoke and they're able to claw it and, and tactically as well bring themselves back into it and then have the courage and the, and, and the balls to kick the winning score at the end. Um, look, this year, even this year in the league, they were down five to Donegal and they came back and win by one. They were down six to Mana and they come back and get a draw. They're down three to Kerry uh, and they lead by one deep into stoppage time and Kerry, Kerry get a draw out of it. So these guys are doing it all the time. Does it help that a lot of these games are on in Crow Park and they've got the dubs in the hill sucking the ball? Absolutely. Anybody that says it doesn't doesn't have a clue about sport. Go and look at sport all around the world. Home advantage is important. It's crucial in big playoff games in America and American football and basketball. And of course it helps them. But it's not just that. They're tactically better. They are fitter than everybody else. They are stronger than everybody else. They are faster than everybody else. And they are smarter. 
and that counts as a lot when it comes late on in games. They love when the game is close now. Dublin actually worship when the game is close. They know they're going to, and they have an aura about them when this game is close that other teams don't. Other teams have this aura built up that they're going to come back. They're going to, they're going to figure out a way. And you just know that the Dubs are going to make the right play at the right time. And that's why they're going to be very hard to stop again this year. All right, all this Dublin loving is absolutely sickening this morning. Let's move on to the predictions uh, this morning. We're going to turn our attention to some uh, event that doesn't involve Dublin this weekend. We start with the Alliance <laughs> Leagues. Mayo against Kerry. Kieran, who are you calling in this one? Yeah, I'm, take, I'm taking Kerry this, this week. I'll take them by uh, three or four above Castle Bar, even though Mayo will be coming with a, will need a big result. I think, uh, I think Kerry are going to get it done. So I, I actually think Kerry are going to get it done too, and I want to win this uh, predictions thing, and I, I'm hoping that there's going to be a Mayo backlash after all the Tim O'Leary controversy during the week, and I'm hoping that they feel that they want to protect this incredible record they have in Division 1, and I'm hoping that they can somehow manage to squeak a win. I don't feel very confident about this one, but... Um, for the sake of trying to win this competition, I'm going for Mayo. Good stuff. Um, Galway against Cork, the fixture of the weekend in the hurling, Kieran. Which way do you see this? Um, I, I'm going to go with Galway. I just think they need an answer. I think they've been waiting for the home game. I think the Tipperary game was called off with the Storms two weeks ago. They missed it. They went down to Waterford and lost a tough one uh, by a point in tough conditions. Uh, Pierce Stadium will, 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 is, is a very good pitch and I think Galway will will have to answer the home fans and, and get a win. So I'll take Galway in there. I'm going to take Cork. I think um, Cork put in a good performance last week and obviously they lost the game so you don't get too much credit for that but they actually did put up a good score in uh, conditions again against a, a, a side who are everybody says is one of the best teams in the country and are playing unbelievably well at the minute. So I'm going to take that level of form and think that they're going to be able to come through against Galway. And then Real Madrid against City. Jerry, you can need us off on this one because you predicted Real Madrid to win the Champions League. So I'm going to be consistent. I am, I am. I really wish Eden Once. Hazard was playing. I really wish Eden Hazard was playing. He's not. Um, so that definitely gives me pause for concern. So this is to go through. That's what our prediction is. Who's going to go through yes, from this side? Not yes. who's going to win the game tonight. Yeah. So I'm going to predict that Real Madrid over the two legs are going to go through because I still think that they are um, one of those teams who are going to hit form and win this whole competition. I, I'm actually going to go with City. Um, I just think that they might, uh, with, with how bad things have gone for them in the league, they're still a really good team with really good players. And if they can get it right, um, I, 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 I'm going to give them a sneaky chance to just upset the odds in this one. So look, I'm taking a bit of a punt with the underdog. Jared they're not Hudson, the underdog, they're the favourites. They're the favourites. You're on the to go, you're, to, Yeah? To go, to go through. To go to, through. Yeah, City are heavy favourites to go through, yeah. Real Madrid. I don't understand Real Madrid being massive well, outsiders. So. We'll, we'll see you in a month's time. Lads, good stuff this morning. That is it I for this week's that. Shot Clock. They're all available on youtube.com forward slash off the ball if you want to check out previous editions. Uh, next up, we're going to hear something from Graham Garrity and Donald Keoghan. They were in studio yesterday uh, after Allianz renewed their sponsorship of the GA National Leagues. What was it like balancing the role of selector and player that you? What did you see in Donald? It was, it was tough for me to try and balance. I, I would kind of hopes of, of playing, but, you know, it, it's they weren't long uh, evaporating, but... Uh, like Donald, and he's proved it over the last number of years. He's one of the best footballers in the country. I'm not just saying that because he's a meat man, but you know, it's fantastic. But at at that time, he'd power the pace, and one of the best man markers that we had um, in meat. And like he's proven to be that you know man marker in the in the country now at this stage. But obviously, meat had developed him in a different way now. And uh, but for us, that's what it was, and that's what we hadn't got at the time. And. Mm. Uh, it's just for a young man, he was a born leader, and, and, and you know, you could see that at that age. That was a different mead back then, 2012. There was still, uh, off the back of the, Le the Leinster title, and I suppose all Ireland semi finals in 09 and 07, there was plenty of lads in that team. The likes of Kevin Riley were around, Graham was in the dressing room. Um, it's a very different mead than we see nowadays in 2020 that you're leading alongside the likes of Brian Menton and I suppose Kenny O'Sullivan. It's a very different mead. Yeah, it's, it's different, but like, the amount of information I took on in those first say, even couple of years uh, was invaluable to me, to be honest. Like, as you said, Kevin Riley, Joe Sheridan, Keane Ward, you know, Brian Farrell, they were Owen Harrington. They had so much information that I was able to absorb off those lads that I could bring then you know, as they transitioned from year to year and as those lads kind of dropped away and new lads came in. That, that was the information I could bring to those now, say, younger lads that they're hopefully learning from me. So. It's kind of cool with any transition when you go from being the say the, the younger group of the the flock to the older now you, you've you've kind of a duty there to instill the knowledge and 
you know, bring lads with you and you know, inform them as much as possible. Like I did, I was like a sponge when I was around the, the older, more senior lads. I was trying to take in all the information to, in the little tips, but now it's, I suppose, my turn now to, to dish it out. Graham mentioned there how when you broke through initially you had the power and the pace and you were the, you were unbelievable at dispossessing forwards as well. Like we, we saw a lot. I remember being a Mead fan in, in Crow Park in those Lancer finals in 2013-14 and you wanted Donald Kogan on Kevin McMiniman or Bernard Brogan. But as you said, you're different now. You're, you're, you're scoring goals. You're one of Mead's main attacking threats. One goal. <laughs> it's just one goal, but you've won penalties anyway. And definitely yeah, assists at the yeah. back post as well. But what, what kind of a footballer do you see yourself as? Or is that, is that a stupid question? Like, do you just? I think to you have to be. I think the modern day footballer as such it needs to be adaptable. Just given that the, the positions don't mean anything nowadays, you could be lining out with number two in your back, but you could be a third midfielder sort of thing. You know that way. So you do need to be adaptable in, uh, in terms of how you play. And I think that's kind of one thing I've tried to bring in the last few years. I tried to, you know, obviously my, as a defender, your role first and foremost is to defend, and you're, that's what you're in the team for. But also then, as a wing for wing back, it gives you a bit more freedom to get up the pitch. Get up a bit and support the attacks, and you know, obviously that comes with different. You need a different set of skills to do that as well. So I'm trying to, trying to kind of master all the skills as, and to be as well-rounded player as possible. But I suppose underage, I would have played a lot of my uh, football in the half back or Kenny half back, centre back, wing back. So I suppose that would be uh, that would be more of a natural position for me is the half back line. Yeah, Graham, would you have enjoyed playing wing back in that mid team at the minute? I think I would, and the way the game has gone now, because it does, as Donald says, it gives you that freedom to get up the pitch. And I suppose when when uh, when I was playing, I wasn't too fond of coming back, Mark, and that. So it probably would have suited me to have more lads around me. But um, yeah, as Donald said, the game has changed so much. It, it's it gives the likes of the cornerbacks, the wing backs, to get up and and you know to get on the end of the end of balls, and and, and it's you know while. It is exciting in a way to see defenders scoring. It kind of, it for me, it kind of takes away in in, in the skills of of the forwards of the game now as well because they end up defending more so than you know attacking than they did a couple of years ago. You know, so it, it's it, it's difficult to to keep that um, momentum coming during the game because you know you're expected to run up and then. Well, what the what do you mean by that? Are you are you talking about the likes of say um, I suppose Brian McMahon and Keenan O'Sullivan? They would have. Roles, I suppose, as forwards, where yeah, they filter yeah. back a lot and break forwards. You guys as well. Is that? Is that? What it's very about? hard to do that. Um, you know, for the whole game, and that's why I suppose you need a big panel. I said, like, I suppose when they came in a couple of years, Graham Riley, for me, it kind of went against the way he played. Although he was a great man from midfield breaking up, when he had to break from from you know the half back line or nearly the full back line. You know, he only do it once or twice a game where he was doing it five or six times a game. And mm. it's, it's it's difficult, I think, as a forward. I suppose, like, we're, ve we're very hard on some of the mid for forwards at the minute that, you know, they don't seem to be getting a lot of scores. But apart from, you know, last Sunday, it was was probably exceptional. But um, it's it's our midfielders and, and our half-backs and, and corner-backs that are getting up the field and scoring. OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Right, you're very welcome back. Now, uh, ultra runner from Cork, Conor O'Keefe, is with us to talk to us about the madness that has uh, taken over his life. So, um, what are we at? The 26th of February. And yeah. how long have you got before your... Um... Uh, coming up about five weeks before I start this. 32 marathons in 32 days. In 32 counties. With 32 pounds on your back. Yeah. Why? Uh, <laughs> Well, I suppose the, the simple answer is uh, I'm trying to raise 100,000 euro for pay the house. Um, th there's multiple ways as to why I'm actually doing it. Um, th I wanted to do 32 counties because I wanted to, to bring it everywhere and I wanted everybody to see it. Um, and then the 32 pounds was kind of a, a later addition. Um, because that, that wasn't was, enough. A marathon no, a day yeah. for 32 days wasn't enough. Well, my background is I'm an ultra marathon runner, so I run distances that are bigger than marathon. So I ran, I ran a 200 mile race in May of last year, and I actually ended up winning the race and uh, becoming the first finisher of the race since 2016, um, and the first, the second person ever to finish that particular race in the time limit that you're given. And I was like, okay, maybe I've got a bit of a, a knack for this endurance stuff. So I wanted to do something like um, a multiple marathon um, kind of feat. And I kind of thought, when I thought about doing 32 marathons in 32 days in 32 counties, I thought, no, I'm probably going to be able to do that. Um, looking at, you know, 
I did nearly eight marathons in two and a half days. So I was thinking, how could we, you know, inject a kind of an element of doubt into it? We, we've been talking about motivation and needing to have something to motivate you to do stuff like this. So this isn't just to, to show that you can do 32 marathons in 32 days. When you, the, the why is actually it's quite a serious thing mm. underneath it all. Big time, yeah. Um, I suppose I, I, I struggled with mental health for, um, for, for many years, in my late teen years, into my 20s, up until recently, really. And um, it was kind of through this whole ultra running and uh, through the training for the ultra marathons that I kind of um, worked my way out of out of this depression, and that's why I decided to do it for PA the House, and that's why the weight is there as well. How did the mental health issues affect your day to day life? Uh, I didn't want to get out of bed in the mornings. I didn't want to even get out and go for a shower. Um, I didn't want to go to work. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I, I isolated myself. Um, it came to times where I, I contemplated taking my own life. Um, it really, really affected me at times. So it, was, it was an up and down, um, constant kind of roller coaster. I'd have these huge highs and then these crashing lows, and I could never like, uh, get this kind of place where I could just be. How did you diagnose it? And how, like, um, what age did this start? Um, my first actual memory was when I was 17, I went to, to Tanzania and climbed Kilimanjaro. Um, for charity, and when I came back, I had this like, huge sense of achievement. I couldn't wait to get home and tell my parents, oh, I climbed to the top of Africa and all these things. And then I just felt so low and empty and hollow afterwards. It was like, I could, I did, maybe I didn't prepare myself for like getting back into normality and like preparing for a leaving cert and all this kind of stuff. And that was kind of the first time that I really remember like feeling like in a depressed state, like feeling like, you know, in a bad mood, you know, in a, in a low kind of a lull mood for, for days and weeks at a time. And did you, did you have access to help at that point or did you know what to do even? That's, think... that's kind of the big reason why I decided to, to raise money for PA to House is because I had no idea about them and I had no idea about what they did uh, or the extent of the work that they did, that they're completely free and confidential and like that they were, they, their door was always open to me. But I just never knew that that door was even that that door even existed. So I, th I think that's one of the big things in that people don't actually know how to access help. First off, you don't know you need help because you're like, well, I just feel bad, and I feel bad because I felt good for a while, and I probably maybe I deserve this, or maybe I'm not doing something right. And actually, Absolutely. and then that becomes kind of self-defeating, and you end up in this kind of situation where you don't even know you need to ask for help. And then if you did know. Where the hell do you go? I felt an awful lot of guilt, to be honest with you, Jar, because I had such a, you know, on the outside, such a great life. You know, I had, a, I was going to a good school. I, my, I came from a very, very loving family. Um, I had everything kind of going for me, really, you know. But I felt guilty for feeling bad, and that's why I never told anybody about it. I never sought any help because I felt like, you know, I have this great life, this wonderful life. Why do I feel so, you know, so bad? I shouldn't feel this way, and, and the guilt kind of stopped me from getting help, really. And as that continues, what happens? Um, as, as it continued through my, yeah. my life, um, I, I was kind of constantly searching for like, uh, something external that I could put my focus on. I kind of realised that without focus, without something to focus on, I was kind of, um, I was kind of lost. So I found, I found Thai boxing as a teenager, then um, Muay Thai kickboxing, and I just got completely and utterly obsessed with it. It was just eat, breathe, sleep Thai boxing, and I, I fought all the way up through the ranks until I fought um, for an Irish title in 2013. Um, and I actually got knocked unconscious in the last minute of the last round of that fight, and that just like obliterated me, you know, in terms of like my emotional um, state and my mental state. I just couldn't take it. So it's just projection of your issues into this one thing, which Absolutely. then there's a setback in, and all of a sudden you're not exactly equipped to deal with that. Exactly, yeah, I had no way of dealing with it. Um, I, I, I had put so much into it, and I never thought about it backfiring. So um, as soon as this external thing that was meant to fix my problems blew up in my face, I had no real, you know, um, I, I had no way of keeping it going. What happens then? Yeah, what happens then? Um, I kind of, I, 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 I actually messed around with Thai boxing, you know, after that point, but my, my passion kind of really died for it. Um, I ended up moving country then um, to kind of like basically leave my Irish life. And a lot of people do that. Yeah, a lot sometimes of people it works. Do that. And, yeah. like, so, and sometimes it does work. And sometimes people are actually able to pick up a brand new life. But I just completely just lived my Irish life, um, which I then, I, when I was Thai boxing, I was like a monk. And I used to just live this like regimented lifestyle where you know, I wouldn't drink or smoke or, or eat bad or, or stay out late. And then um, from, from there, I went to the complete opposite end and just took a nosedive into the bar scene. Um, where did you go? 
um, I was just, I, I, oh, where did I move to? I moved to Vancouver. So like when I, I had picked up these habits of like going out and drinking quite a lot um, in Ireland, and then I just basically brought them with me when I moved to Vancouver. So um, that kind of was like a fruitless endeavor. I stayed there for about a year. I got this, this burst of kind of like, I want to reignite the flame of this Thai boxing career. And I actually moved to Thailand. Um, and I fought there again for a while, but I, in the meantime, I was actually I was diagnosed with a benign cyst in my brain. Right. So I basically shouldn't have been boxing at all, and that kind of was always in the back of my mind. So that just completely killed it then. Okay. And how's your mental health through all that? Um, it's up and down. Um, as long as I kind of had something that I could focus on or whatever, it was kind of it was okay. But it was very very tough for me to to regulate my own thoughts. So. If I would think about something that um, would be bothering me, like uh, sometimes I would think about my Irish title fight back in 2013, and I'd get this the fight or flight. I get the I get the raised heart rate. I get the burst of heat, and I wouldn't be able to like properly deal with with certain memories, um, and and that kind of that was like a, a constant uh, through through the whole thing was I wasn't able to actually deal with anything from my past, um, or dealing with any painful memories or anything like that. So how do you develop those skills? Um, for me, it was when I actually, I had actually ran a 100 mile race um, before I ran this 200 mile race that I was uh, talking to you guys about. Um, and when I started to train for the 200 mile race, I thought back to this 100 mile race that I had done. I'd, I'd done it with, I had done it with seven weeks training. So like a lot of these things that I do are just like, boom, snap decisions, let's just do it. I had seven weeks training, trained for the Connemara 100 and my body just completely gave up on me after mile 55 and my mind got me the 45 miles home to actually finish it in 28 hours. And I thought about that more and more, that I was going to have to put my mind in those uncomfortable positions over and over and over again to, before I did the 200 mile race. And so when I put my, my mind in those uncomfortable positions and I, and I, and I stressed my body and I stressed uh, my mind, it broke down barriers for me. Um, and I remember one day in particular, it was a really cold February morning. I had always run with my headphones in, music playing in the mornings. And all of a sudden, I was in this 30 kilometer run. I was about 300 meters in. And I heard, beep, beep, my Bluetooth headphones died in my ears. And I was left with like just, all I could hear was my footsteps and my breath and my thoughts. And I just kind of let them run. And I, and I was started to think about all the reasons why we were here and why I was doing this and why I was, you know, why I was trying to get my life on track and why I was trying to, to, to train for this 200 mile or why I was trying to do all of these things. Why was I trying to keep going? And uh, when I actually allowed myself to actually have those thoughts and have those kind of interactions with myself, I was able to think through all these things that used to give me these, these, these fight or flight, these bursts. They didn't, they didn't happen anymore because I was able to think about them from, from, I was taking accountability, I was taking responsibility for what happened. I was also grateful for my life as well. I was grateful that I was able to make it through all those times. And the final thing was I was compassionate with myself. And I was actually able to forgive myself for decisions that I had made, for you know, mistakes that I had made, for times I had taken the easy way out. I was able to actually forgive myself for all of these things. And as I worked through all of those things, I realized it was nothing about the running. And it was nothing about how much mileage I did that morning or, you know, if I went out for a half marathon in the morning. All it was was about getting out and listening to me and listening to what I was saying. Did somebody teach you that? No. Completely, I suppose, self-learned, let's say, um, out of nowhere, really. If, I, I feel like there was something working with me that that morning my headphones died because I remember running 30 kilometers and thinking about all these things. And I was in work and I wasn't in work. I was just completely, I was there in physical form, but in mental state, all I was thinking about was that run and thinking about these things and not having that, not having that burst of, of like ha raised heart rate when I was thinking about these painful things. So I, I finished work. I put back on my sweaty gear from that morning and just ran from work. Just went out for another like 15 kilometers because I was like, I, I thought in that time I had to be there, I had to be running at that time to, to unlock this, this new way of looking at my life. But that actually wasn't the case. It was just that uh, it just happened that way. And uh, then I would start thinking about it when I was sitting down having a cup of coffee or I was on the bus or I was So you accessed or, your own... Exactly, yeah. I was, it was just able to... And it now was you like, can access it any time you need it. Yeah, perspective. I suppose is the is the is what it is. It's like I was looking at my life from from a certain angle for a long time, and I just 
allow myself to take that step to the right or step to the left and, and look at it from these different angles. And as soon as I did that, it was, I found here. I wasn't up here and I wasn't down here, I found yeah. here. Which is peace. Yeah, I would, I would say so, yeah. I'm still on this journey, it's still continuing, you know. And you have to be careful about it to make sure that you don't lose that perspective again. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I suppose that's the thing that I, uh, I, I, I do um, quite, quite a lot of public talks and things like that, but I said the best thing for me to actually do is to, is to show people what this is about and the physical manifestation of this kind of like new rebirth in my head was running. So that's why the 32 marathons in 32 days in 32 counties came. Look, it is a remarkable story and I think anybody can't but be inspired by what you're saying. There's a GoFundMe for people to, there's, yeah, to it's donate. A, it's I Donate. Um, there's an I Donate page on my Instagram. Um, C O'Keefe is the Instagram page and that's where most of it's coming, coming through. So starting on April the 1st, running 32 marathons in 32 days with 32 pounds on your back in the 32 counties, all for Pieta House. We wish you the very best of luck Thank with it. It's much. a phenomenal sure. undertaking and I hope we're going to follow you along the way and uh, day by day check in and give people updates to try and help you get to that 100 grand. Thank you so much. Cheers, Con Connor, great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. Now off the back of the announcement of his upcoming Lake Regale episode on TG Car, David Brady joined Joe in studio last night. Here he is on how he's been instilling a love of mayo in his children despite living in Dublin. So uh, at the end we saw your wife and the two kids. Oh, we, we... Will you buy them a Dublin jersey now or just wait for the inevitable? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, then. You're a comedian. <laughs> oh, stop. <clears throat> <clears throat> Alan Brogan said he's going to buy my young for the first jersey. <laughs> um, as long as they're healthy and have an appreciation for sport and the fun and the mornings before games in our house is kind yeah. of this road to Crow Park and it's, you know what, it doesn't matter if it's a ballet costume Luke puts on him mm -hmm. or a jersey that Hannah puts on him. I would say, as long as they're, I would say they already know the words to the Green and Red and Mayo. There's indoctrination of a serious, Hannah, serious Hannah, level going on there. I'm awful sad. <laughs> Hannah, I used to play it. <laughs> on my wife's stomach. <laughs> Stop. I swear to God. I, I, now this is around the night before an Ireland final. <laughs> Um, 2014 or 16, but anyway. So Hannah in the womb. She knows, the she knows it, I'd say, back to front. Yeah. But she's gone as bloody smart now. She sings the Blue and Navy of Dublin. And I'm going, you little... And, I, and she loves the way it rises me, but, right? but it's, you know what? It's about football. Yeah, of course. It's about GAA. It's about young people. It's about not inflicting generations of pain on your children who are free from the burden of having been born in Mayo or, in my case, Kildare. Nathan Murphy's at the same crack, buying Mayo jerseys for his kids. I mean, it's just, it's just not, it's not going to happen, is it? Like, saying, my kids are, like, I'm from, from Wicklow. They're born and bred in Dublin, like, they're, they're blessed, aren't they're, they? Yes, They're yes. absolutely blessed. They're it's, it's wonderful... a genetic lottery that they've won. Yeah, yeah completely. Like this, this clown over here with his genetic lottery for being from Kerry. You've mm. no appreciation for what this means. Uh, no, look, he's going to start yarrowing now. That's so, look, just such a good feeling. <laughs> so if, if you happen, I, 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 I mean, obviously I don't wish it on you at this stage of your life, but you know, maybe you should have your kids early. There's a, there's a, a, a positive There's a lot to be said well. for having kids earlier there than is, that. There is, definitely. I mean, look at how haggard we are. <laughs> um, do you have an intention of giving them little carry jerseys and like raising them as... I would like to think that anybody who has a potential claim to carryness would take it. <laughs> See, like, he's gonna. They're gonna be like uh, in the Dublin it, schools, just with just yeah, any, any head to toe in any green little bit gold. Of sense, uh, like uh, as long as uh, as long as a bit of uh, intelligence is actually transmitted via genes, then they will be able to make their own mind up that carries the way forward. <laughs> yeah, they'll be able to make their own mind up. Tom, what do you got right for decision. Uh, unfortunately, as uh, more coronavirus chat, uh, the IRFU will be meeting with Minister for Health Simon Harris this morning to discuss whether Saturday's, uh, Saturday week's rather Six Nations match against Italy in Dublin will indeed be called off on government advice due to that coronavirus outbreak in Northern Italy. Uh, Minister Simon Harris spoke to OTB last night and he says he's received clear advice about the situation. I've very much seen their public statements in recent days where they're um, where they're talking about uh, following government advice, and of course, of course, everybody in relation to um, sports and sports fans will want to keep everybody safe. So I expect the IRFU will follow government advice, and indeed, I've heard them say that publicly. These are not decisions, and these are not decisions that are taken lightly uh, in any way. Mm. But public health obviously does need to trump um, every other consideration, and the idea that you'd be 
hosting a game in Ireland where you'd be encouraging other people and do two games where you'd be encouraging other people to travel mm. um, from an affected region um, would just not make sense from a public health point of view. Yeah, uh, if that men's game is cancelled, by the way, the women's and under-20 matches will follow suit. The threat to mass gatherings such as the Cheltenham Festival starting on March 10th looms larger with that coronavirus outbreak as it spread across. There were cases in Switzerland, Austria, Croatia and mainland Spain uh, yesterday as well. I've actually contacted the BHA, so they'll hopefully have an update on that situation on O2B later. But I understand there are contingency plans in place for things like the Cheltenham Festival that would uh, see it pushed further down the calendar. Okay. So, um, They're talking about the Olympics now as well. So like it's getting to the point where massive... Sporting events are the Euros. You'd imagine is the Euros like has the got big, to be. It's almost the biggest threat given the fluidity of it. Yeah, and well, it's because it's a, it's not is a multi location, multi country. Oh, the, well, I mean, one facet of that to fall down. And yeah, and a it's a bit of a, a trouble. And like, well, uh, or it also gives them the safety. Like, we can have loads of games here if we're not, if if somehow the island finally plays in our favour. But they would need to be <laughs> up against a, a country that's like. We just don't let their fans travel. Yeah, I guess you could probably do that. You have to keep testing the teams and keep, uh, look. Obviously, sport's not important if it is going to be a global pandemic that is going to kill millions and millions of people. But if it's just the flu, then we should all be having conversations about that too. Yeah, well, undoubtedly. Uh, should the rugby game go ahead, one player that will not be involved is Keane Heaney. The Leinster props over the hip injury in that loss to England, and he's been ruled out for the rest of the well, scheduled tournament. Um, there have been calls for head coach Andy Farrell to make wholesale changes to the side following the loss to England. And Locke James Ryan says if there are any new faces that do come into the side, it will be an honour for them. Look, like it's ultimately, you know, we're picked to go out and do a job for our country um, and to perform as, as well as we can. Um, so you know you're you're looking about you're you're just you know kind of focus on getting picture and getting selected yourself. Um, you know I think it's it's a it's a it's a massive honour and privilege for anybody that comes in. So you're always delighted to see you know anybody that's in the team. Um, but uh, you know I fully believe that we're we're moving in the right direction. Um, yeah, it was a disappointing weekend. Um, but you know Scotland Wales, you know we we two good wins there. Um, we're well aware we weren't at that standard uh, last weekend, but. As I said, we'll review it Wednesday, Thursday. Um, we'll take the key measures on board and then, um, yeah, we'll get back on track. Meanwhile, in the Champions League, a nightmare second half likely cost Chelsea a spot in the quarterfinals of the Champions League. Robert Lewandowski scored one and set up Serge Gnabry for a couple as well in a 3-0 win for Bayern at Stamford Bridge last night. The task for Frank Lampard's side wasn't made any easier by the red card to Marcus Alonso and Lampard says it was a tough evening at the office. Yeah, a really strong team. I was aware of that. And unless we were to get everything right and bang on, it was going to be a tough night. And we didn't get everything bang on. We weren't confident in the ball. That was my biggest disappointment. So it was... a uh, a harsh lesson, a reality for the players of the levels we want to get to. Antoine de Griezmann, meanwhile, scored what could have been a crucial away goal for Barcelona last night. The Catalan Giants drew one all with Napoli. Despite having gone behind, Barca ended the game with 10 men following a late red card for Arturo Vidal. While Raheem Sterling is fit for Manchester City's Champions League clash, last the 16 round tonight in Madrid against Real Madrid. Uh, despite the impending ban for financial fair play breaches, uh, City boss Pep Guardiola does not believe it's this season or bust regarding European Cup success. No way. These players will have a lot of chances to win the Champions League no, this season. I know it's in a big opportunity. It's the last 16. In the same time, it's not the last one. So when you are going to die and after there's no more chances, but in life, if you are in this business, you want to train, you want to play, always you never know what's going to happen. The other game this evening is Leon up against Juventus. Both those games kick off at 8 o'clock. While at 5, Rangers take a 3-2 lead to Portugal in the second leg of their Europa League last 32 tie with Braga, uh, obviously kicking off at 5 o'clock. Well, West Bromwich Albion have a seven-point lead at the top of the Championship this morning after their 2-0 win over Preston North End last night. Nottingham Forest have jumped to third. They had edge past Cardiff by a goal to nil. Uh, at the other end of the table, Luton gave their survival hopes a boost at a 2-1 win at home to Brentford. Uh, and Huddersfield Town beat Bristol by by the same scoreline elsewhere. QPR beat Derby County by two goals to one. Leeds United can move back within four points if they get the better of Middlesbrough later, looking to make it three wins on the spin for Bielsa's side, while Fulham against Swansea is one of the other six fixtures this evening. And a semi-finals night in the Munster Airgrid Under-20 Championship. Clare face Cork in Milltown Malbay, while Limerick house Kerry in Rathkeel. Both of those games throwing in at 7 o'clock. All right, Tom, thanks very much for that. Uh, we're going to take a quick break at 9.24 this morning. OTB AM. This 
is OTB Sports Radio. Off the ball. This is after a Glasgow University research which showed that former footballers were three and a half times more likely to die from brain disease than people of a similar age who hadn't played football. That's a tough worry to have for you, isn't it? That's probably not one that yeah, you no. like to dwell on too often. Uh, no, I'm, 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 I'm acutely aware of it, to be perfectly honest, in terms of um, how vulnerable I potentially will be to it, which um, is not, it's, it's a pretty dark thought as such. Off the ball. Weeknights from seven and weekends from one. This is OTB Sports Radio, live 24 7 on the Go Loud app. OTB AM. Right, it's time for something very different now on Off the Ball on OTB AM this morning at uh, 25 minutes past nine for you here. Um, we're crossing over to the library of the Lazie Centre and the Ida refugee camp in Bethlehem where a group of Irish friends are pulling off a pretty impressive feat. Anlo Carillon is with us now. He's a gym owner f- uh, in Cork, but you're in Bethlehem trying to replicate what you've done in Cork in the refugee camp there. You're trying to build a, a gym and movement centre. How's it going? Yes, how's it getting on, lads? Thanks for having us on. Um, well, we've been out here for 10 or 11 days at this stage, and like it's been one of, for six of us here, it's been one of the most intense weeks of our entire lives. Like, just this, every time, you, it, it's like every time you turn around, there's another thing happening or something, a, a brand new kind of experience that uh, is kind of, so it's been, an, it's been an emotional roller coaster, to be honest with you. Um, the first thing that we had to do was try and get the equipment. Uh, into the movement space that they have here. Uh, like the room that the place is in used to be an old disused store room. Rubbish. A lot of fundraising over here before we arrived. And then we had the challenge of trying to get like about two and a half tons of gym equipment into the West Bank, which is, uh, you know, like <laughs> it's a fairly big challenge. Uh, and we um, pulled all sorts of strings and did all kinds of like acrobatics to get the gear in. And on the, the day that we, the day after we arrived, the truck rolled in and uh, we unloaded the pallets and uh, started assembling the gym straight away. And that's kind of the starting point for the week. We kind of went from there. OK, so let's spool it back a little bit to the point where you realised that you would like to bring gym equipment to the West Bank. And what was the inspiration for that? Well, I was out here a couple, a couple of years ago and uh, I got to spend a bit of time here at the Lodgy Centre where, where we're sitting now and where the gym is located. And to be honest, the thing that kind of struck me most was that the Lodgy Centre does spend so much time and effort and put so much emphasis on kind of uh, teaching their young people, giving the young people opportunities for the, the residents of the Ada refugee camp, which is where we're located. There's five and a half thousand people living in the camp here in a uh, three quarters of a square kilometre space. So that's a, a lot of people for a very small amount of space. We're completely surrounded by the apartheid wall that the Israeli authorities have built. I'm actually, I can see it right now over the top of my computer. I can see the refugee camp. There's six watchtowers that are manned around the clock. And the people here are just living, like they're being squeezed from every single direction. And the thing... Ah, our Skype line has gone to Bethlehem. We'll be back to that in just a second, but it's a fairly remarkable achievement to be able to get that amount of gym equipment into the West Bank and then to, um, to even... to to concoct the dream of doing it and then to be able to pull it off. So they're installing the gym this week and that's why um, we thought it was worth bringing you this piece this morning. So we'll try and re-establish the Skype connection to Bethlehem there. Yeah, that's class. I wonder, like he says, pulling strings and a certain acrobatics to get the equipment in, that's, yeah, it must have been quite exceptional what they actually had to do to, to do that successfully. I mean, it's obviously a fairly, uh, it's uh, incredible in all the wrong ways, the, that part of the world at the moment. But um, for him to be over there to, to try and to give somebody uh, a little bit of a, a shining light in their day-to-day lives is an, is an incredible thing. So fair play to him. Hopefully we'll be able to, to establish that line now in just a sec. Yeah, it's um, the second story we have for you, which is a bit different from um, what we would normally bring you in the show, but the whole notion as well of running 32 marathons in 32 days. This is the second inspirational character who sat beside you here in the studio. Well, I want to, I want to He's going to carry 32 pounds on his back. How heavy was Deontay Wilder's costume? Was that 40, 40 pounds. Was that 40 pounds? Yeah, so yeah. But basically Deontay Wilder's costume, except he's going to do 32 marathons in 32 days. So, yeah. so uh, screw you, Wilder. Exactly. This guy should have in videos of this guy running marathons beamed into Deontay Wilder's next camp before he does it. Well, he can be the Joe Brawley, what do you think of that Joe Brawley for Donaghy? Uh, he can be that character for Deontay Wilder as he's doing the uh, sit-ups for the rematch. Yeah, well, like what do you think of that would be the, uh, Deontay Wilder's uh, rebuke down the camera lens when uh, he eventually does beat Tyson Fury. 
Uh, but yeah, no, it's like, what is there like a, a limit to the amount of marathons you should do in your life? Uh, like, without actually uh, exceeding that in the space of... Uh, yeah, your mic's just gone there. Oh, and so anyway, we'll go back. I think we can go back to, uh, to Anla in, in Bethlehem. You can hear us now again, can you? Yes, yeah, sorry about that, lads. Don't know what happened there. Yeah, no worries. Um, I'm, I'm sure the internet connection isn't always great there either. So you were it's saying not. that you were out there a couple of years ago and you realised that um, there's uh, a whole heap of people who are living in very confined spaces who could really benefit from having some access to the equipment. Yes, exactly. I mean, it, it, it was the, the gym is just kind of like the, it just so happens to be the medium that we were able to help because that's what we do at home. But the thing really that resonated with me was the fact that the people here at the Lodgy Centre are providing opportunities, cultural opportunities, health opportunities, and um, working around the clock for the people of the camp here. And that, it kind of really resonated with me because I had kind of been given similar opportunities by the generation ahead of me in Belfast. I know like during the 90s and stuff like that there from a school perspective, a cultural a sport and everything like that there. So I think that the whole purpose of this trip is to kind of just show solidarity with with the people here in Palestine, in particular the people in the Ada refugee camp. And it's been a recurring theme for us that like the, the, the Laji Centre might as well be at the top of our street at home, if you know what I mean, because it's the same oppression all around the world and uh, is exactly the same. So we're just really carrying the feelings that we had about, you know, like people having fair opportunities in life in Ireland or anywhere and just bringing them here and doing what we can to help. Um, like the people here don't want charity. They're not, they're not begging for help. But um, we are just here just to show them that, we, that, we're, that we're standing with them and we're doing whatever we can. And look, if, I, if we were a bunch of carpenters, we'd be, we'd be over here building furniture or whatever. Like it just so happens that you know, we run a gym in Cork and... There's massive health problems in the camp with diabetes, with uh, high blood pressure. They've got a community health workers program that goes around testing these things within the camp, but they didn't have the facility for you know, bringing people in and doing a bit of exercise with them. And the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems that they have here is space. So it's just been a real pleasure to be able to change an old disused storeroom into a functional space. Like I swear to God, the day after we finished the gym, there was a wee group of circus, a wee circus class with kids training in the gym and I was just sitting down at the wall just cramming eyes out looking at it like what what everyone at home has helped us do like we're out here representing everyone who's helped us with uh, the fundraisers with playing music that raise money or into the GoFundMe campaign or wishing as well and the six of us are just out here just doing the job that people kind of like have give us the blessing to come out and do and to see those kids just there being able to fall on the ground where there's a soft floor getting training having a safe place to to play, it's just amazing. Like it's it's uh, um it's just I'm just really grateful that we've been given the opportunity to come and do this. As to put into context the situation here, there was a, a young lad who was playing just standing outside the Lodgy Centre. I, mean, I can actually see the spot where it happened now that was who was killed by an Israeli sniper in the watchtower that's only a couple of hundred metres up from where, where I'm standing right now. Recently. That was a few years ago now, but like the thing that the, the ethos of the Lodgy Center is that the soldiers come down here all the time. Like they shoot tear gas. This is known as the most tear gas place in the world. A few weeks ago, whenever before we came here, I was on the phone doing a, one of these kind of video calls with uh, one of the founders of the of the Lodgy Center just to get an idea of the floor plan for the gym before I come over there. And all of a sudden you just heard doof, doof. next thing the whole gym, the whole room of the gym is now was filled up with tear gas. He was red in the face, trying to flip and nearly throw up and had to get out of there. And the ethos of the Lodgy Centre is that when the soldiers come down here, that they can hear the music, the Palestinian music coming from the Lodgy Centre. They can hear the kids laughing. And for uh, for us to be able to just contribute a little bit to that, I think is one of the greatest honours like that, that we've any of us have ever had. Um, how did you get the gym equipment in? What was, how, how was that, how did you make that happen? Um, it wasn't easy. Uh, one of our team here, Sally McMonagall, um, who's from Clarney, worked around the clock. Like this project has been going on going for a year and a half since since the kind of first idea came to where we are today. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of a funny story. We we got um, someone to help us on the ground here. Uh, I don't know if he's ever seen the episode where Top Gear raced their raced cars in the Hamas tunnels in Gaza. And 
getting into Gaza is a whole other story, and we're in the West Bank here, but the person who did that, uh, who ma- ma- managed to make that happen, we had made contact with him, and between the jigs and the reels, we had to get someone over here to accept delivery for the equipment on our behalf, and kind of pretend that they were you no know, setting up a wee personal gym or something like that in their back in their back garden, and uh, there was a lot of people involved in that process, and to see that, that night when the gym gear rolled in, like it was like we'd won the World Cup, and to be honest, like when that gear arrived, I was thinking to myself, we can just go home, we could go home right now, because the the whole, as I said, the gym is just the medium by which we we have the opportunity to show solidarity with the people here. But a big part of it, we could have just bought the gym equipment here. We could have went in and got it from Tel Aviv or somewhere, like one of the Israeli cities. But the whole point was that we were able to do this. The whole point, uh, by not giving over the money that we've raised to Israel. So I think that um, I think that we we kind of bypassed the system there, like, which is a really big victory. And I'm so glad that we were able to do it. It cost us more effort and probably more money as well at the end of the day to, to do that just with shipping and stuff like that there. But for me, like that's a massive victory. Like they are after building this wall all around all around the physical and like sort of uh, the physical and emotional social lives of the Palestinians and making it really hard for anything to come in and we work together with them to try and to to break that, which is you know, I think that's class like personally, but <laughs> And so what happens now? You, you've, you've managed to build this gym. Obviously, you want people to use it continuously for years to come. Is this the start of a, a longer... I mean, it's obviously not the start because you've had this relationship clearly with the people there for a long period of time now. Is this a life, the beginning of a life's work for you? Does it feel that way? It, it certainly... It cert- there was a certain point during the last 10 days or so where I was like, right, everything up until now, it's kind of been theoretical. We're planning, we're working together, we're trying to get the gear in, and the gear arrives, and that's kind of like Christmas, you know, when that happens, you're taking stuff out of packaging as fast as you can and assembling it and screwing stuff into the wall. But then there came a point where I was like, right, shit, I was like, this is a serious thing now, because I think that one of the worst things that we could do now is set this facility up, leave, and then just not, people not knowing what to, what to do with it. Um, and so I had we've got it established a coaching team here now. There's five young people from the camp that are really eager and keen to learn, uh, how to how to train themselves and how to train other people then eventually and integrate the gym into the other programs that they already have here at the camp um so but we had a meeting yesterday and i was saying to them like this is a way if we can set this up really fast and we'll go home and then you can open it tomorrow and let, open the doors and let people come in you'll have a gym set up really fast but it might not be here in a year what we're aiming for is that this place is serving the people of the area here for the next 10, 20 years, and that's going to take a bit of time. We're going to, we are aiming to bring people over to Ireland to train them for a month uh, in and around June. Uh, I'm planning on coming back. I know some of the some of the rest of the group want to come back as well to spend a little bit of a longer time to help the people get a, um, so the place gets a bit of traction, you know, and that uh, because I think that doing it, doing, the fun, you know, international people come to Palestine quite often, but I think that, that, that the, the real value is that if we can set something up that's going to last a long, t- a long time. And I was saying to the team here now, yesterday when we had that meeting, that the coaching team here in Palestine is now kind of merging with the, 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 coaching, the coaching team that we have in Ireland. And it's going to be, a, it is a long-term project and it's going to be a real, a real challenge. So we're just going to go for it and, and uh, see what we can do. And is it easy enough for you to get in and out? Getting in and out can be a challenge sometimes. Um, the, the 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 authorities at the airport uh, really don't like it if anybody's coming over here to show solidarity or support for Palestinians. Fortunately enough, we did get through through okay, all of us, in um, quite fast time when we were coming here. The next challenge is going to be getting back out again. Uh, and so obviously we'll, we'll be able to get back out, but it's just a case of being able to get back out without having uh, a big mark against your name because we want to come back and, and maintain this relationship with them. The first time I came over here, there was a night a nine hour kind of wait and questioning at the airport. So we arrived at two in the morning or something like that and didn't get out until you know, mid morning the next day. We were just sitting there asking questions. What are you doing here? Who are you visiting? Do you know any Palestinians? Are you a member of any organization? All this kind of crap like, and, but at the end of the day for us, for us, that's just a once off or maybe a couple of times experience for the Palestinians here. It's every day. Like see, to give you an example, we were in Hebron the other day doing a tour. <laughs> First of all, there was one of the settlers out there was straight up on our faces with a camera. He was like videoing up, videoing us, and like trying to put us off and trying to um, incite um, aggression. 
or and the, the checkpoints that we went through, which is kind of a regular occurrence here, you have to go through big checkpoints, show them your passport and your visa slip. We went through it and our tour guide that at the time is a fellow who I became friends with last year, Abella, uh, it's such a nice guy. He was giving us a tour of Hebron and when he was coming through, the soldiers were, were, were questioning him, had to take all his, all his gear off, empty his pockets. They were like, where's your knife? Where's your knife? Where's your knife? And over and over and over and over, uh, they were just kind of like trying to incite him to, to get um, to get angry and stuff like that there. So for us, going through checkpoints, going through the airport, it's a, it can be a challenge, but it's nothing compared to what the Palestinian people are going through here on a day-to-day basis. So um, we, for, for us personally, we just have to take it as it comes and do what we can to get through so we can come back again. You're obviously, uh, I presume, continuously looking for funding to help with the projects. If anybody wants to donate, and uh, what's the best place to do it? So we'll have a GoFundMe campaign. Uh, it's gofundme.com forward slash West Bank Gym. Now, we had an initial target of 15,000 euros to, on that there, but since we got here, like we're going to need, we're going to need an additional 20 grand to be able to bring the coaches over and to make the whole project sustainable for the long term. So that's where people can go if they want to donate. We're also on um, at uh, Ackley underscore Palestine in, on Instagram and Ackley underscore Cork is the, is the Cork based one to see how they're going to work together. And then we're on Facebook uh, under Ackley Palestine as well. And it's an amazing story and congratulations on getting the gym equipment in. Best of luck with it. Thanks a million. Safe home. Thanks very much. That's all the best. It's uh, Enlo Carroll on there uh, talking to us from Bethlehem this morning. That's all we've got time for. We've gone a bit over there, but it's 9.40 a.m. this morning here on OTBM. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, on the, uh, off the Ball's going to be back on your radios tonight from 7 o'clock. Ronan O'Gara and Damien Delaney in studio. Uh, Chelsea against Bayern Munich, Napoli against... Uh, now, that was last night. Uh, it's going to be the Real Madrid game tonight. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can subscribe to the OTBM podcast, fully timestamp, making it easy to find exactly what you want from this morning's two-hour show. Football with Graham Hunter, the shot clock with Kieran Donaghy and ultramarathon runner Conor O'Keefe, as well as the story of the Irish gym in Palestine. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow at Champions League, plus Kieran Donaghy and Brian O'Driscoll in the studio. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio.